Hey guys, welcome to the latest episode of Beyond the Tape. Uh, this is the latest episode of Tech Talk, episode two, where I sit down with Lockie McKillop and Mick Williams, and we talk shit about bikes for a very long time. It's a two and a half hour episode, so set aside some time. We go through bike geometry, um, some hot or not stuff, and listen to questions. A uh, really good episode. Um, it might change your opinion on a few things and how you're riding and your bike setup. As usual, thanks to Canyon for sponsoring all our episodes. Um, loving their support. Need a new hanger the other day. Uh, rang up the Australian distributor in Melbourne and asked for a hanger. Purchased it. Got it sent here. Super quick, super easy. Love their work. Uh, even though it's an online brand and their stuff is usually sent from Germany, they do have their Australian warehouse. And if you need any small parts or advice, you can speak to an Aussie bloke and get the right advice and right parts. Again, if you want to get your suspension dialed and or want to get it tuned, uh, hit up NS Dynamics brands like DVO, Olens, and Forsprung. You can't go wrong. Um, they're very knowledgeable people. So if you have any questions about your setup or what you want to do, send them an email or two and, and get it dialed and they'll sort you out. If you're looking to lube up your chain, get your bike running better, Demonte Tech from 2 Up Bike Co. is amazing. Like that lube and grease is second to none. I'm frothing on their free hub grease. Um, I do have one of the affected batches of the DT Swiss hubs where they do decide to bind, but if I didn't have that free hub grease, I probably would have to send it back for warranty. I can't be asked. It's not a DT Swiss issue. It's me just being lazy. And 2 Up Bike Co.'s grease is help me be lazier fe sports um they distribute brands like vera Vera's are some of the best allen keys that you can possibly get high-end torque wrenches it's some of the best stuff you can possibly get but if they don't tickle your fancy uh make sure you head out to lead out sports and check out their pedro's tools again super high quality amazing stuff if you want a more bike specific tool um doesn't affect the wallet too much but the quality is still there absolutely love their stuff and hey if you want to get instagram famous with all of your bike work they also do abby tools so if you want to photograph everything you do on your bike and make it look good abby tools quality and looks are next level so don't forget to head out and hit up lead out sports um, australia's number one bike tool and bike servicing need company um franked keeping me on board and keeping us clothed which is amazing love their stuff dirt surfer is keeping the mud out of my eyes crush is keeping the mud off my bike and i mean fist hand wear i'd be fingerless without them uh love their stuff got too many gloves anyway enough talking um there's a lot of it in here we talk about yeah as i said geo bike setup everything so enjoy the podcast. Um, again, if you've got any listener questions, if you've got any questions for any of us, just drop us a DM. We love to talk to you guys about bike setup. And as we say in the podcast, us thinking about how to answer questions often helps us learn more about bike tech. So all three of us are bike nerds. We love talking bikes and answering questions. So hit us up. Um, yeah, thanks to everyone. Grab a beer, grab water, grab wine, grab whatever makes you happy and enjoy the episode. Mick and Lockie, welcome to the second episode of Tech Talk. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, mate. Thanks for inviting me back. That's all right. It was a good good time last time. Everyone was enjoyed it, and uh, listener feedback was uh, epic. So, thanks guys for coming on and, and doing That's that. That's good. I had a lot of questions as well, which was I think yeah, Lockie probably second that sort of yeah had a, had a lot of questions. So it's good people are engaged. They had some awesome conversations, which was the coolest bit. Like. Sometimes I just mm. get weird questions about just work shit, but that yeah, was no, it was yeah. like it really opened up the dialogue. Hey, like I had yeah, genuinely, yeah, people that were genuinely interested. So mm. yeah, mm. cool. Um, are there any sort of one thing that I guess we talked about since last month? Was there anything that uh, either of us kind of got asked privately that we wanted to sort of recap? at the start of this one. There's a couple of things that I got asked that I thought were good questions that it kind of be kind of cool just to go over real quick. Yeah. Oh, I um, can't remember any on my end, but yeah, I have a couple, but like they were techie, they were kind of techie things that I think I just put stories up for. Um, I had a lot of people asking about charges, uh, charger re um, shimming. <laughs> I was just like, <laughs> like, 
No, but then um, we obviously got that thing sent in um, from Push, which was interesting. So mm. that was kind of all I had. What did you have, Nick? Uh, yeah, well, I had a couple, um, mainly just around the whole sort of high pivot thing, whatever. Um, one question that I had was, because uh, I mentioned that like a high pivot and a high idler are technically two different systems. Mm. Uh, it's just by happenstance that a lot of time they're, they're combined to get the, the desired outcome. So I had a lot of questions of people asking whether they can put a high idler on their standard non high pivot bike, just a normal four bar. Uh, it's a pretty open ended question. Uh, shorter answer is no. <laughs> Really? Mainly because the look, it's kind of this double edged sword thing. You can, and it might be better in some circumstances, but it'll mm. probably negatively impact in others just because the bike companies, when they're designing the bike, obviously design it around sort of what that bike is designed for and around its, its anti squat and, you know, all sort of the, the kinematics. Yeah, um, so, short answer is I would only do it if you jump on to something like linkage software, which I use for all my stuff, and actually see what mm. it'll do to your bike before you go ahead and screw an idler to the side of your frame. Because a lot of teams have tried that, right? And yeah. Yeah. it hasn't really come to fruition that it's worked. So, obviously, people have tried it, but yeah, it's kind of the same with mixing and matching like brake levers and stuff, right? You can do it, but unless you actually know what's going on with some software, maybe you shouldn't do it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, you know, and there, there's certainly some hybrid systems that can get you an advantage, um, yeah. you know, for, for one specific kind of thing. But um, Well, like O-Chain does that, right? Kind of. Kind of, yeah. Kind it's, of. It's, mm. like, yeah, it's a whole different kind of the kick topic. Down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the other one that I had was uh, that I, I don't know if we explained in the last one, but um, was just around uh, what's the difference between a high pivot and a high virtual pivot. Mm. Um, so virtual pivot, I, I should say that like, yeah, virtual pivot doesn't have to be a high pivot. Like, um, like a V10 is a virtual pivot. It's not a high pivot, but it's a virtual pivot. Um, so combining the virtual pivot and the high pivot, like what we've done on the Trinity, um, basically, hang on, I actually did a little drawing. Um, oh, I wish I could see your screen right now because I need to see this drawing because I want to conceptualize it. I don't know if you, I don't know if you can see. Geez, this is going to be real wacky because I can't actually see what I'm. I can't see what I'm actually presenting, so I'll try my best. <laughs> this is like backwards. Oh shit! Yeah, it's upside down, and I can't even see the screen right. So uh, number one here is a normal high pivot in the way that the axle path in purple is totally dependent on the main pivot. Mm. A virtual pivot, in this case, a, a virtual high pivot, is where the axle path, which I'll draw sort of in purple, as the axle moves, it isn't moving like the normal high pivot. It's moving uh, in a bit of an ellipse, so it's still backwards but kind of it's elliptical due to the fact that in this case, like the, uh, the seat stay is split. So there's a pivot between the axle and the main pivot. Yeah. So as the axle moves up through its path, the pivot here where it's actually like the center of this uh, ellipse as it moves up is actually moving away mm. from the pivot point. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why it's virtual. So, yeah, as this moves through, its uh, pivot point is sort of moving away. So that's the the virtual pivot in short, very short. But I wish um, I could see it, but I I I feel you've explained that amazingly at the same time. Thanks. Yeah. It just kind of winged the shit out of that. So <laughs> I went very deep into this, as Mick knows, for the next Revo article, and it's blown my mind into pieces. And How good is it going deep on stuff, hey? You're just like, have you seen that graph of like, it's like what you know versus once you research it, like what you actually know, and it's just yeah, like, yeah. It drops <laughs> off. Like, yeah. It's fucking gnarly. You get back to this point where you're like, I don't actually know if I know anything more or anything less. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was chasing my, chasing my tail for a long time, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Mick helped me out a lot in that one. Shoot, I'm getting read it. 
but uh yeah it's pretty interesting in what mick's saying is like you can you can also tune a high pivot more right because you're not stuck to having the pivot on the frame so you can tune that axle path and the kinematics uh again it's a bit of a rabbit hole yeah you can um where you get sort of into the the ultra tunability say like with a high virtual pivot um you can get real gnarly with your tunability if you want to say because you've got a you've got a virtual pivot so mm. you're not just uh relying on that one pivot point as far as like everything is dependent on that one pivot point uh that pivot point is essentially yeah virtual um and that's when to go even deeper is when you uh, combine that, say we like what we've done with Trinity is a virtual high pivot with the eye track uh, idler mechanism is that the effect that the anti squat is having on that whole system is also dynamic. So you can get real gnarly with, um, yeah, with how your suspension kinematics work. So yeah, you've got like a heap of tunable kind of characteristics there. Mm. Yeah, but having that tunability is not necessarily a good thing either because people can just go overboard and it, <laughs> it may just end up riding For sure. <laughs> For sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, cool. Was there any other questions you guys got or was that pretty much? Um, I'm sure time? I got a couple of other ones, but, yeah, that was kind of the, the standout that I thought I'd just kind of cover because mm -hmm. it got asked a couple of times from a couple of different people. So, so It's good to see people engaging. We're always Damn, questions, are, questions. questions are rad hey especially around this stuff i feel like like people read stuff and just assume they meant to know what it means <laughs> yes yeah. well, yeah. yeah the other thing too is like i i think it's good to be um to kind of yeah to be challenged to think about it like i remember an old physics teacher of mine was like you know i never understood this stuff until i had to teach it and i feel as though it's kind of the same even like with this stuff like i kind of enjoy I get the question about it because it makes you actually think about it. Like, do I actually know this or am I just, yeah. yeah. The it's... last four years with Stu with SRAM, that was it, eh? Like so much stuff solidifies in your brain. And you're just like, I knew, I know how it works, but when you have to learn how to explain it, you learn it in a whole different way. Like... Mm. Absolutely. Um, sick. So I might actually, I had a few people ask about after I changed my suspension. A little bit based on Lockie and your your advice. Oh yeah. So I went and added. So I wasn't going to change my bar uh, my suspension until I messed around my bars, but I'm going to do my bars next. Um, so I end up putting a token in the front and the rear yeah. just to balance it and keep it kind of even. Um, so I'm now running three and a half in the front and three in the back. Uh, for those wondering how I got half a token, it <laughs> involved a hacksaw and it was very easy. Um, but I'd like two and a half. Half tokens is actually, as I grab thing, here's one I prepared earlier. I just got heaps of shit in my drawers. The if you're making a half token, don't just cut the threads off. I don't know if you can see with the line, no. you see where that lip is. A half token is very little. So at about that line, maybe a little bit, a little bit taller. Yeah, yeah. I think I cut it at the, the molding line. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty yeah. close. Or you can 3D print them. Yeah. Um, like a bag. I would like a bag of them, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Connor Hunter, I, I should give a shout to Connor Hunter. He's a local Melbourne OG BMXer slash mountain biker. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he 3D prints his own volume reducers, which are pretty cool. I think Samuel Brownlee made, like, a custom one, so I'm just grabbing more stuff, but... He made like it was like a super nut dog or something crazy. Yeah, right. Just, like just filled up like the entire top of the can because you couldn't get enough ramp. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, yeah, that's Connor. Connor made me a what do you call it? A thick boy, which was five, the equivalent to five reducers, but it was in one oh, wow. block. Very very spiky. He yeah. ran it. Um, I didn't. I didn't run it. I tried it, so it was way too spiky for me. Mm. Um, but yeah, serves its purpose. I think if you were like putting together a shock for a slope style bike or something, it could certainly mm. be pretty oh, good. A little, little tiny human, yeah, for sure. Yep. Um, but after doing that, 
like it, that small bump compliance was like really good because I could run less pressure because I wouldn't bottom out as much. Uh, I have to note that I'm riding real slow at the moment because I'm still dealing with a concussion, which sucks. I was going to say it's from all the, all the um, doms, from all the lifting weights. But... <laughs> no, it's definitely... I. It's weird. It's like uh, it's like watching Mick at the moment. It's like I got this delay in my yeah. head, so it's just like the reaction times are so it's slow. I was wondering where you're going with that. Not yeah. All day. yeah. And then I just get you know blown away by the beauty that's on the trail as well. Um, yeah, I found though that I'm not using all my travel, and I think that is because I'm riding slower. Yeah. So on, I run a I run a pretty rampy setup. Um, on the trance around a really rampy setup and I'll do the same on the calendar, which is what I'm going to do after this play with it. But, um, I only use my full travel on the gnarliest shit, like mm. maybe once every couple of weeks it happens, but it, it's, um, few and far between as opposed to before with less tokens, I'd probably buy them out once a ride. Um, but it's kind of there if I need it, which is cool. But most of the time my sag, like my sag rings like 10 mil from the top, sometimes more. Yeah, I'd say mine's probably like 15, 20. Yeah, yeah. But it's nothing nothing crazy. Uh, best thing it did, though, was with that extra support is I could take some low speed off, which has been yeah. sick for my bung wrist. Nice. Yeah. So it's just opened it up. And, again, I opened the rebound a couple, like you guys said. Yeah. Still playing around with that. It's just feeling a little bit twitchy, but... Rebound is like such a uh, rabbit hole that you can spend a lot of you can spend a lot of time on it, and it's beneficial mm. to spend that time on it. But I was going to say I've got my shockwaves back. If you do want to give that a crack, ever. I might might regain. Um, and the other thing is I've got new tires on there, which I think is a very missed part of suspension and tuning your bike. Hundred percent. Because these things are they're two point fours. And they're almost like full 2.4. Like, they're like Schwalbe. They're like a big 2.4. Yeah. So I had to drop my pressure 5 PSI to get them feeling like similar. Now it's starting to. So that affects your suspension. But I'll mess around with that more in the future. And then bar height is next. Yeah. Bar height, eh? Hey? Yeah. Yeah, bar yeah. height's a gnarly one, eh? Hey? I'm happy with my bar height choices now, but I, I did learn a lot from... Uh, Moya and bring Atkinson, bring Atkinson to be honest, and bring him up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I can't run super low, but I'm just going to try it and see what yeah. happens. Yeah. Which kind of leads us into our topic for today, which is pretty rad. Um, I'm pretty keen on this one because I'd like to hear your guys' theories on it, and I have some pretty controversial theories compared to what marketing tells me to do, <laughs> <laughs> um, which I think a lot of people might have, but I don't, I'm not sure. But we're going to talk about kind of geo, bike fit, numbers, what what they all mean, head tubes, angles, numbers, stuff. Um, I guess like the first question we had was uh, like, what is I guess, as we were saying before the podcast, we're kind of based on like old school bike theory and stuff, and you had those road bike fits. Mm -hmm. But like a bike fit for a mountain bike and using geo and mountain biking, like how do you how do you guys go about choosing your size and and working things out for someone? Cool. Do you want to go first? Well, thing? yeah, for sure. Um, what do you want to start with? Just frame, Darren. I mean, frame for me, like I'm. I go to reach like that's the go-to yeah. for me is like looking at the reach numbers. Um, I saw a thing that Connor Fearon did uh, just the other day. I think he was talking to Josh Carlson. I think that was where he mentioned it. But anyway, he mentioned that the same thing, like he just kind of goes with, uh, I think he was saying he's on a medium trail bike and a large downhill bike, but they were around the same room reach numbers um which which makes sense like they're going to feel like a similar bike so yeah for me i kind of go uh go straight towards the reach and for anyone that doesn't sort of know what reach is reach is basically the distance between uh the top of your headset back to your bottom bracket so if you drew a vertical line from your bottom bracket up uh 
and at a right angle where that met uh, the top of your, your head tube. Um, yeah, so if you drew a vertical line up from your bottom bracket and then a horizontal line perpendicular out back from your head tube and it ran into each other, that's your reach number. So personally, that's kind of my go-to. I like, depending on what I'm riding, like, and that's kind of thing, like your reach number changes depending on what type of bike you're riding, like dirt mm. jumpers, I kind of, well, my dirt jumper at the moment, the reach is a 430. Um, I reckon for a dirt jumper, like I really like it, but like as a dirt jumper for tricks and that, I think it's probably a little bit too long, um, but it's kind of good. My uh, my common style Supreme downhill bike is a 445 reach. So it's kind of in that realm. Um, the Trinity is uh, around the same. I think it's 455. Um, but yeah, personally, like I'm 58 uh and the go-to like rudimentary first number i would look at is reach so yeah kind of around that 440 i guess for a gravity orientated bike and how um, about you I'm, you'll say I'm scrambling to look up my reach because i don't even I, I thought it was 450 but yeah 450 450 is like my magic number um i use geometry geeks a lot I kind of have like a bike that works for me the best and geometry geeks compares geo is a different bike. Okay. Um, so it's pretty sick. You go on there and you select your bike and your size and high or low, if there's different settings and you can compare it to other bikes. Um, reach and stack stacks a big one for me, like bar height kind of ends up being bar height is, is a big thing. Like I like my front high up. Um, the Jekyll I'm getting, I sat on one the other day and I was like, this is the first bike I've sat on where the bars feel normal, like with the stock bars and like mm -hmm. a steer tube that's not, you know, stupidly long. Um, but yeah, reach for sure. Like it used to be top tube and obviously now the way they slope so much, it's, it's gone away from that. Um, I have never looked up a dirt jumper's reach. <laughs> I was about <laughs> to look it up then, but I've got a DMR sec that feels rad, but what the reach is, I have no idea. Um, it's probably, yeah, I don't know, probably be around the 400 mark, I guess. Yeah, it's like a BMX, man. It's sick. I love that thing. But, um, like, yeah, kind of 450 is the magic number. It, it does depend on the chain stays. That's a that's a big one for me. Like, yeah, the reach will change. But the I feel the back end of the bike, if it does change, will make a difference to it. Um, but, yeah, I feel reach is the number. And that's what everyone talks about online, too. Reach, 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 reach. You know what I mean? Like, and they're all getting longer. Yeah. Well, like to me, a reach is important on bikes you stand up on. Whereas for a cross country bike, the top tube might be more important because it measures from your seat tube to your head tube. Yeah, I'd kind of, I'd kind of argue against. I, I, I see what I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, you're wrong. No, I'm <laughs> I, no I, I think. <laughs> no, I think that reach is the only thing that matters, and then. Mm. And then obviously tuning your seat angle, depending on the discipline, which in turn will mean sort of your top tube length. Um, but I, um, the reason I don't say sort of top tube is I guess because your top tube can be effectively changed by sliding your saddle up and down its rails. Yeah. Um, so I would rather, this is just me personally, I'd rather get the reach dialed in and then adjust my top tube like if it feels a little too short or a little too long just by sliding the saddle sort of up and down mm. um that's sort of just me yeah i i i get you, like i get what you're saying i i do kind of agree um but personally i kind of hardly ever look at um the top tube because the top tube is just a derivative of the reach and how steep your c tube is mm. I used to work with a dude, Ant-Man at Velofix, who's like the, one of the fit kings. But I used to be top tube too. I'd always look at top tube, you know what I mean? And he was the guy who was like, nah, it's just reach and stack, mate. That's all it is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, and, okay. And the more you look at that number, you're like, yeah, actually, that is a more universal number to apply. Top tubes can be measured in so many different ways, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. that's the other part of it. But um, but the, yeah, the exactly. forward, like that, that one's a weird one because when I think about it in my roadie brain, it's like you exactly. kind of want to have a certain offset to the bottom bracket for the way you pedal. So I definitely get both sides. Yeah. Mm. 
Yeah, but, but you, reach, reach is the number. Yeah. For roadies, you're in one spot for a mm. majority of the time, whereas a sure. mountain bike, you're on the nose of the side, it moves around. So yeah. it's not as important. And for people that aren't roadies, it's, yeah, exactly that. Like you'll blow your knees out if your offset is completely wrong to your cleats and everything. So yeah, it's much, much more important. There's two positions on a mountain bike, really, that you're looking at. You know, yeah, it's the standing and the sitting. Even if it's an enduro bike, you're still sitting. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, roadies is just sitting. Like you got to yeah. be dialed. Um, yeah, and basically the difference is one's measured from your bottom bracket, one's measured to your seat tube, and the reaches yeah. to your bottom bracket. You guys mentioned stack. Um, what is stack, and why do you, why do you guys measure it? Because I've had a couple of Norcos in the past mm. and they run like a, sh uh, well, I'm talking, sorry, head tube measurement. Mm. How's that reflected in stack? Because Norcos run real short head tubes and heaps mm. of steerer. Well, stack yeah. takes into account the axle of the crown, doesn't it? So like, because the head tube number is kind of irrelevant on mountain bikes. It definitely is a big thing on road bikes because mm. like the head tube really, the, the axle of the crown is pretty similar on most road bikes. With um, mountain bikes, obviously, there's an aspect of it which is going to take into account the fork, the travel with mm -hmm. stack, at least in my head. Um, but it's a straight line down. You know what I mean? So it's still going to take into account. It's like, isn't it from your axle to the top of the head tube? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So, yeah, I think stack's an important number with travel to get the front end at the height that you require that will also change how your fit's going to work with your reach because it'll change kind of where the bar's going to sit once everything's attached, unless you cut your steering short. Mm. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's kind of, yeah, you got to kind of look at the, the holistic bike because, as you were saying, if your head tube is super short, then it means that potentially you're going to have to run a heap of spaces kind of under your stem or a high stack stem to kind of bring it uh, to bring it back up to the desired height. Yeah. Um, there are certainly some bikes on the market that are, yeah, either a really long, uh, yeah, like uh, really longer, really long uh, head tube or really short. Mm. Um, so yeah, just say like slamming your stem on the top of the top cap isn't going to feel the same depending on what frame you have because the head tube might be different. Mm. Um, but then, yeah, I, I think uh, stack in the stem, like if you want to isolate it just to the stem, uh, yeah, stack is like your stem height basically, like how high mm. the portion that covers your steerer is. Yeah. Mm. Stack, um, stack, height, stack height's important. Like <clears throat> I've always again, kind of going back to a specific bike in terms of measurements, and that's been like my magic stack height. And then I'll accommodate the bars and the steerer to get that to the right place. And then a lot of the time, to be honest, I'll actually go up 10 mil travel at the front just to bring the fork up without just bringing the bars up. You know what I mean? That does affect the bottom bracket height a little bit, but yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, okay. The main reasons I see longer or see the point of a longer head tube is it's going to retain the original geometry of the frame more because mm -hmm. as you adjust that stem up or down, it does go forward and back. So it will retain that frame sizing more. Yeah, yeah very. And you're right, like uh, minimally. So I guess, like, if, and this is one thing that I think we might have got asked, but. Um, just for layman's terms, call your head angle 60 degrees, which is two thirds of, of 90, just for layman's terms. So basically for every, uh, for every two mil you rise, you raise your bars, it's going to come back towards you one mil. So you, yeah. you're losing one mil of, of reach. If you go up by like bringing your bars up two mil, you're losing one mil of reach. Very, very minimal, but it's still something that, you should think of because uh, I think Baxter might have even asked that question as well. Mm. Yeah, I think the, you um, I had that with the, the very short lived downhill bike that I had um, <laughs> just to play around on before I changed jobs. 
But yeah, I was running the thing up super high because I have a higher front end and Hayden at work was like, but you've just made the whole thing short and it was feeling short, you know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. um, especially with downer bikes, when you can drag those bad boys through it, like it does make a huge difference. It does yeah. Make mm -hmm. um, I'm going to sort of, to go back sort of a step in regards to what you're saying, like this is going to be sort of contrary to what you guys were saying, but I like I was when I was riding a lot of BMX, like in my teens, early twenties, like I was a really big fan of high bars. Like, yeah, I had like uh S and M Grand Slam bars, which I think were like an eight and a half inch rise yeah. or eight point two five. So like I was a fan of high bars. And then towards kind of the end of riding a, a lot of BMX, it was kind of the craze was coming in to have lower bars like longer frame lower bars mm. and now like for anyone that kind of watched the olympics the other week i think yeah it's pretty obvious that a lot of people are on quite low setups like even stems ran upside down and whatever to get kind of low bars and the argument was to get sort of more weight over the front like more aggressive kind of stance um that's kind of rubbed off a little bit on me with mountain biking like um i kind of like low not a low front end i wouldn't say low but yeah, not propped up. Yeah. Oh. So, and this, like, this is the thing me and Bax have talked about before, right? And he's in the same boat as me. Um, yeah. So, and this is where it comes down to, like, you as a as a person, and especially mm. where your centre of mass is. So, like, my ankles are fucked. Um, they're not <laughs> fucked like Bax's and breaking them, but they they just have no. I have no flexibility. So, like, if you do a flex test with your ankles and like your knee kind of flexibility, mm. you kind of have your foot at a at a wall. You should be able to stand 10 centimetres back from that wall and kind of squat into the wall. I can't touch the wall if my foot's at the wall. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I, have, I just have no ankle movement. And it's a, yeah. it's a hereditary thing. I can't fix it. Mm -hmm. But I would have these low front ends. Like I bought, I remember buying those um, Gravity 777 bars because Blinky had them, like the flat ones. Mm -hmm. And I was just, I had too much front end traction the whole time. It's because I can't get my weight back enough. I've always got that center of mass too far forward. Bringing the front end up reduces your reach, but it moves my center of mass back and takes more weight off the handlebars. That's why I have that higher front end. And that's where with, um, you know, following trends with anything in mountain biking, like it's where your center of mass is and that's how your body works. Because yeah, that, it's bicycle, a good point. You're, you're the main weight. You know I mean, it's not a moto, it's very different. Mm. So that's where it's got to come into play and not everyone's going to get a bike fit on a mountain bike. And I, I wouldn't say the benefits are there like a road bike, um, but there's so much personal parts of that. that If you just start following trends, like that might be a whole rabbit hole. You may get nothing out of You may get a lot out of it too. You know what I mean? But um, your body and how that works is such a big factor. Uh, yeah. That's what I, Norco's, Norco's done in their manuals. Sorry. To I was, off. Yeah. No, I, was, I was just about to say the same thing with the Aurum. Yeah, yeah, when they bought out the HSP, they had that whole thing on specific body types and like yeah. even came down to they, uh, I think they even had recommendations for um, suspension pressures and sag heights and all that type of stuff. Yeah, based on like um, endomorph, mesomorph and ectomorph, like your body type. Yeah, your body, absolutely. Yeah. Body weight. Like, and that's a huge factor that I don't think people, it's the same with sag, right? There's so many different ways to measure sag, but. I think you need to be consistent. You need to be in your riding position to where your hips kind of are in relation to the bike because that's mm. where the center changes, you know what I mean? But, yeah. Mm. Yep, absolutely. That's my rant. <laughs> well, no, that's what I was going to kind of touch on as well is, like, people go out of their way to set up a fork because they're not getting enough front traction, but their bars will be up way high and they'll be sitting on the rear tire. Yeah. Like, it is... The amount of times I'll go into sp suspension for handling issues when it's actually a bike fit or geo issue. Hundred percent, man. Like I would consistently run twenty percent sag in my forks to keep the front end up. Now mm. I run it at thirty percent, and I just have some tokens because I like the ram. I have more front end traction. I've brought my bars up, and the whole bike works better. You know what I mean? Like I'm not mm. jeopardizing how my suspension works to get my bars to sit in a certain position. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we are kind of touching around the front of the bike uh, and we've mentioned a few times, but it seems to me like the head angle 
for marketing and, and most people is the most talked about thing in the world. Yeah. Um, obviously, because it kind of makes the most difference when you write it. Like, from a bike manufacturing standpoint, is it that important, Mick? Uh, yeah, I reckon it's super important. And I think that um, bike manufacturers sort of, yeah, as kind of a, a meta narrative, like just gone way too far in regards to, to Slack. And it is oh. down to personal preference. And, you know, I, I won't argue for some, like against someone that says I prefer a Slacker head angle. Like that's for the same reasons we just talked about then, maybe their body type genuinely does suit a suit a, a, a slacker head angle so i'm not going to argue against that but as a as a general rule of thumb i think that yeah it's certainly got too slack in my opinion yeah um likewise the reaches have kind of got too long um but yeah i'm i'm really not and maybe again this is a bmxer type thing but i'm really not a fan of a head angle that's too slack um i'd rather be able to steer the bike um and the other thing too is like i've heard the argument that like a, a slacker head angle will monster truck things better which i guess is kind of true in the way that if you're running into everything mm. that the fork's going to come back not a little bit like a rearward axle path in the back so if it's got more rearward movement ability it's going to run into it nicer kind of my come back to that is because like I've tried a few setups like I've tried sort of ultra slack a fair bit steeper whatever and I feel as though if it's not steep but if it's just in the realm of not too slack is that instead of having the monster truck into it you can actually pick up over it like mm -hmm. you can pick up the front end and get the front end over it instead of having to run into it and relying on it being so slack um and to go back to what kind of we we're saying about suspension setup, I feel as though a lot of people that want a really slack head angle maybe don't have their suspension set up correctly. Um, I think if it's set up correct, I think there is nothing wrong, like 64 degree head angle. Yeah, I don't know. You don't need, like, just as a general kind of rule of thumb on most sort of trail bikes. Mm. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty, and like, again uh and i know i've re referenced him already one point but uh yeah i saw a thing with might have even been with you darren um of connor at medina and he was saying the same thing about his setup he's like yeah doesn't really get the the really slack craze um i so, think he actually yeah. runs like his angle set in reverse mm -hmm. like he yeah, actually so steepens, steepens it up, up. yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And like on the same on my on my meta, uh, like don't get me wrong, it like it's designed around a one sixty fork. Probably should have a one sixty in it, but I've got it set at one forty just to really bring the front end angle steeper. Because like I've tried it with one sixty, and I honestly feel better with twenty mil less travel for the same reason I was saying before. Is like I can pick the front end up over stuff because it's more kind of under me, it feels like more natural. Mm. Um, whereas when it was swept out, like, yeah, I had more 20 mil to absorb it. But the thing is I was running into more stuff because like my body position compared to the front, I was so much further back from it. So I just couldn't pick it up over stuff. Mm. Um, you know, it's not an ideal sort of scenario, but yeah, just as a, a little sort of insight, um, yeah, I gained more out of particularly turning too, but I gained more out of losing 20 mil of travel just in the bike handling characteristics. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think especially okay. going to like bigger wheels as well. Like I think that's really highlighted. Yeah. That bikes don't need to be as slack. Like I think in the 26 inch days, like slack, it probably was a bit better just from the wheel size and obviously where the technology was and, and fit, you know what I mean? Whereas now, I don't think it's as needed. And I'm in the same boat, Me, Like, I don't like something that's super slack. Well, um, it's, it's also that law of relativity too, hey? Like, slack, when everyone was on 26, people were like, oh, geez, that's slack. And it's like, well, compared to, like, what everyone else is riding, so it's, like, steep as head angle, like, yeah. whatever it was, 66 or 67 or whatever. Yes. Whereas now slack is, like, 60. Mm. Where it's like, 
they're comparing it to stuff that might be 63 or 64. Yeah. So it's all that relativity thing too. But like, you know, the, the plowing thing, I think is more relevant on a 26 where the wheel's smaller and rolling over stuff differently yeah. compared to a 29 mm. where it's the, the wheel monster trucks, you know what I mean? Like, you know, and obviously there's a fine line, right? Cause the holes are getting bigger cause everyone's on 29 now, but like, um, yeah, I just I just think that's a I think that's a big part of why that's changing, and I'm, I'm sure we'll get to the enduro bit in a sec, but I think that's where the enduro stuff's going to. Yeah, and like I, yeah, you're right, and a lot of people you've seen that like obviously yeah, I make equipment to to mullet bikes, but say a lot of people that have say a 27 bike, like the bike's native as a 27 and a half, which is quite hard to mullet. Like really, the only option you've got is to reduce your fork travel by 20 mil yeah. if you want to run a 29 or up front yeah. um and a lot of people and a lot of friends of mine too have argued that the loss of 20 mil of travel in the front there's more gain out of running a 29er in the front than what you lose out of losing the 20 mil of travel mm. yeah i'm yeah. the same yeah i think the 29 sure. i prefer 29 of both so i won't get into the mullet versus yep yep same wheel size debate but i think the the big front wheel makes so much sense from a traction and rolling standpoint because mm -hmm. it's the same with the bar height thing right like if your front wheel gets hooked up on shit your center of mass is going forward and you're going over the bars you having that less chance of leveraging yourself pinging off the yeah. car is going to be better and i think a wheel helps accommodate that you know what I mean? mm, for sure mm. yeah 100 percent. i'm in the same boat as all that like i was blown away when i, I saw that new norco range mm -hmm. uh, uh 63 degree head angle on an enduro bike like mm. that just it's not an enduro bike anymore it's like a downhill bike and I think that's where those bikes are going. I think it's they're, a bit silly. They're, they're park bikes or what was like the giant faith back in the day. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or, like, I think that people are making these A-line bikes and that's not what endure. It's not bad thing. I think it's cool. I think the downhill bike's changing, but uh, I don't think that's an enduro bike. Yeah, I think we've got to be careful before this turns into just last week's discussion about park bikes and DA bikes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I just, yeah, I don't know. I feel like, uh, this could be another controversial thing where I get in trouble, but a lot of new riders and people that are in the sport don't want to actually ride the bike and pick it up and pop it around as much. Yeah. And they just want to sit there and let the bike do everything. Like it's a roller coaster. And yeah. that's where this geo starts to, to come into play. Mm. I think, uh, I think that's where it was. And I think that's changing. I think Common Soul um, was that that work for a, for a while. I just don't think it's going to work as much anymore. Like people want to move it around a bit more. But that was the benefit I reckon for the last two or three years. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And we've seen like a, a steep at seat angles and stuff becoming more popular. Mm -hmm. um, what are your kind of thoughts on that one, Lockie? Like, has that made a big difference for you? I love it. I absolutely love it just from a pedaling uphill standpoint in no yeah, way I, I, shape or form does that help down at all yeah, yeah in fact I, on some bikes like because I, I run a pretty i've got pretty big hips like sit bones on some bikes it's annoying because like when this like i need to get a bigger dropper so my seat's more out of weight it's hitting my legs that pedaling uphill i remember when i got the new i think it was the rain I can't remember if it was yeah. the rain. No, it was the rain. So I came off a trance, the original trance. Right now. It was like the, the one upgrade I just didn't care about. And then when I rode it, it was the, actually the one thing that was like the best, the best <laughs> one. Because it's like you got to pedal those things for a while. Like it's just a better position. Mm. Fair enough. Mm. How about you, Mick? What are your thoughts on the whole steep at seat angle? Yeah, look, I like I'm of the opinion, and this is kind of what we thought with Trinity too, like, if you can make the ergonomics of the bike work and it's not sort of negatively impacting on the ergonomics of the bike, I think the, the seat, the, the steeper, the seat angle, the better. Yeah. Hmm. Um, like obviously you've got to make it work. There's a bandwidth and parameters that you've got to work with. Um, but yeah. 
This is where I start to change my thoughts on a few things because I like the smaller wheelbase, the steeper head angle and reach. I don't like to be too long either. But if I have a steep seat angle, I get real cramped in my seating position. Yeah, that was interesting. Like, I was surprised by that. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it could be a combination of factors. Hey, like, obviously, uh, seat position plays a bit into it. And then, of course, the bike sizing thing comes into it again. Like when I was saying about uh, reach is the only thing I look at type thing, Mm. that could negatively impact on the climbing ability. And I think this is where potentially could be at a bit of a crossroads um, where, well, not necessarily crossroads, but it's certainly a difficult thing to design a bike where it'll descend well and climb really well. Mm. It's impossible. Um, yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah, there, there's an overlap. Hey, like, you know, there's only so well it'll do one and so well it'll do an, another being the same bike. So, and this is where I was sort of saying before, is that if it ergonomically works and uh, you can make your suspension kinematics work around it, the steeper the seat angle, the better. But like what you're saying, if you make the seat angle too steep, it'll feel awesome descending. Like because that like that's taking into account your reach. Like you're not even sitting on the seat. So it could feel awesome descending and whatever. But as soon as you sit down, you could be if it's too steep, you'd be like, whoa, this is really cramped. Mm-hmm. Like I'm so far forward, I'm really cramped. Um, so I think it's finding kind of that that Goldilocks zone. Like I don't know off the top of my head what uh, seat angle your your canyon is. Um, I don't know what size you're riding either. But yeah, I think it's probably a prime example of kind of those crossroads where the two are kind of merging. Where it's like, whoa, yeah. I reckon it is, that number will uh, settle at some point. You know what I mean? Like it'll just become like this is the number. I reckon. Well, it seems to be settling now. Like, I think the giant was 68 degrees. I think my canyon is 65. Like, it's very slack. Um, The reach number I always try and attain is uh, 480 or 485 is, like, the max I'll go to. Yeah. I think the rain was 490. Yeah. But the rain was very cramped. Which is funny. I went a large rain and it was, like... That bike was fine. I just I went large and I shouldn't because I'm a little man. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. never never corner the thing. You know, I mean that's the the trend but, of trying to go big bike. But yeah. But because again, as Locker you were saying, like the center of mass when you're climbing, because you're more centered, mm-hmm. there is less physical work on your upper body when you're climbing in a steeper seat angle. Yeah. So effectively your efficiency of climbing is a lot better. Yeah but it might feel more comfortable. <laughs> yeah. So I have to move more on the canyon, but I do actually prefer it when I'm just trundling along. Yeah. Uh, what are your guys' thoughts on um, crank lengths and stuff? Like uh, I saw the other what's, day. What specifically? Sorry? What specifically? Mm. Well... The reason I kind of ask is because I saw Remy Morton was running Hope 135 mil cranks. Yes. Yeah. Chainless weird bike. I've, I've talked to Remy pretty extensively about this just because another project kind of we're involved in, um, which you can't really give away too much. But um, just he, making zero mil cranks, are you? You just put No. Well, <laughs> I was going to say that. Huh? No. Well, no. Basically, long story <laughs> short, no. Yeah. Um, basically, uh, without sort of giving too much away, that's been tried, but not not well received. Um, so, and I think this is the thing, like, again, I hate to use the analogy, but it, like everything's a bit of a double-edged sword, hey? Like, if you look at BMX back in the 80s, people were on like 185, 190 cranks because like really shallow start hills, like just all, all about torque, like, you know, you wanted a you wanted a stroked engine, basically. If you want to put it that way, like yeah. you wanted long crankshafts, just because it was all about torque, low RPM. Yeah, you just wanted leverage. Um, whereas, say with BMX, just to use to keep going down this sort of track, is that just say with um, like supercross hills and whatever, 
there are guys that are like six foot who have even experimented with like 160 or 165 cranks just to get super high RPM just because they don't need the torque. Mm. Um, the thing about Remy and the 135 mil cranks is, I guess, firstly, he's not running a chain. So he doesn't have to pedal it. So he's not concerned with how the cranks are feeling while he's pedaling. Um, what he's relayed to me is that the reason he likes it is because one, your, your front foot and your back foot are closer together. So your center of mass is, is closer or well, your mass, sorry, of your legs is, is closer to the center of mass of the whole system. And then because your legs are closer together, kind of on the X axis, if you want to call it that is that apparently he reckons it's easier to get your knees closer together and your hips kind of locked in. And I guess if you're doing a lot of riding like he's doing, then that could be pretty beneficial. Um, so yeah, he reckons it's, it's pretty wild, but depends what type of riding you're doing. Mm, there's so many factors with crank length, like there's the bike fit and there's like your knee and joint health. Um, and there's, bottom racket height and rock strikes like mm. such a dynamic thing like i know what crank length works for me from a road fit standpoint and i do the same thing on my mountain bike because my knees are fucked um and it's fine for clearance you know what i mean so it's all good uh, if i could try 165 cranks on a pound meter i probably would just to try it because tinkering and stuff's fine um but again, like that 170 is my kind of crank length. And that gives me a good range of movement with my knees without hurting them too much. Because the longer you go with cranks, usually the more it can hurt your knees if you've got issues, like depending on what your issue is. Um, femur length is a big one. And then I listened to that podcast with Jason on the Gypsy podcast with Remy as well. And like super interesting. And the more yeah. I thought about it, I was like, you know, why doesn't he try something at zero? Because... It sounds like what they're doing is getting closer to moto, you know what I mean? Um, and you look at the different ways they can articulate their body because of where their feet are. It's, it's very, very different. But, um, yeah, it's, I think crank length is, is really a, is a preference thing. And then if you bring e-bikes into it, it's even more different, right? Like if I was yeah. on an e-bike, I'd be running probably 155 cranks because 250 watts are getting banged out through that motor and I want my cranks to not strike, you know what I mean? So... It's a pretty dynamic thing. I think kind of it's something you need to try and test yourself if you can, if you want to go down that rabbit hole. But then at the same time, mm. probably just go with like what's kind of stock. <laughs> I, I know that Ben Cathro did a lot on this in one of his series, like how to, it might have been the how to ride a bike or whatever it was. But Dave Habich was telling me about it. <laughs> And apparently he settled, and he's a tall guy too, but apparently they settled on 165 as like the ultimate length for mountain biking. Um, yeah, I I see his point, I guess. Like I see his points. Um, I've tried 175s on my enduro bike and they were a tad too long. Like I'm not that tall either, but they were too long. Like to, to give a reference point, like, I was 175 on BMX my whole adult life and tried a little bit, a little bit longer. I tried, uh, tried one eighties, but that was kind of shallow hills, tried 177s, 177 or 177 and a half. Um, but 175 was just the go-to and it is in sort of the BMX thing. So I put 175s on my enduro bike just to kind of see. But it, yeah, it's so funny because a 175 on an enduro bike feels so much different to 175s on, mm. say, a hardtail or a BMX bike because you're standing up the whole time. Yeah, I was um, yeah. yeah. So just, I think the way that your, uh, like, uh, yeah, you, like your biophysiologically, like how you actually put your power down when you're sitting on the seat compared to standing up is just totally different. Um, so yeah, like enduro riding, yeah, I'd be kind of like I'm probably a 170 guy, but I see the argument for 165s as well, because mm -hmm. um, they, as far as I understand, anyway, they did a fair bit of sort of quantitative testing. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see if the shorter stuff comes in, like downhill, for sure, 165s mm -hmm. um, could definitely go shorter. Um, 
But like what benefit, like, so if you're not striking pedals, what's the benefit of going shorter? Like, is it, because it's the shorter you go, isn't it, the more benefit you get from a higher cadence? Yeah. yeah, so if you go shorter, you can, it's easier to spin because like the distance traveled from your, your pedal is going to be less so you can get a higher RPM. Yeah. Um, so I understand it in that regard, like on downhill, um, torque isn't an issue because you've got gravity behind you. Mm. So it could be good to have a shorter crank just to get little, even if it was half cranks or whatever, just like little nips in there. Yeah without the risk of striking. Like I've definitely striked on 165s. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you can, you could definitely go shorter on that. I think a little bit like we were saying with the, like the reach, this, the seat angle, like all of that stuff. I think of course there's like a crossroads where you come to where, yeah, it's kind of that law of diminishing returns. Like what you're gaining out of one is sacrificing the other just too much now. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where, say, Remy is kind of in a realm of his own because he's got no chain. Like, he's not worried about the pedaling side of things at all. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah. We can definitely agree that Remy is an outlier for sure yeah. in what he he's does. The scooter. And, and I don't, I think what he's pushing is, is cool. Like, I, again, that podcast with Jace was it, I can't remember what he called it, um, that style of riding. Like, he's trying to make something new. DHT. You know? Yeah, downhill just, trials. Yeah, that that shit is cool. I mean, but it, that is such a niche um, thing. <laughs> yeah. Just cycling, because he's not really cycling. No. Yeah, I think it's it's certainly different. Um, so yeah, the the one thing they were saying sort of about like side by side pegs is with an an MTB, it's kind of weird because like you're so used to say with MTB riding like you lift your inside foot up, outside yeah. foot down. Yeah. Um, and on a moto, like I'm thinking about when I ride my moto, is if I go into like a rut, say, like that, you kind you of sit. default, you sit. Yeah. 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 But that's how you support it. Whereas a downhill bike, you can't really just plant your ass. Yeah. Like you'd almost have to like lift your inside foot out, like, you know, yeah. like nailing a rut on a moto almost if you had to struggle. In the triangle of your legs, like doing a lunge versus like just a squat in terms of yeah. weight pushing around for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's that's... interesting stuff. I'm, yeah. I'm keen to see where that goes. Like I'm, I wouldn't even say skeptical. I just don't think it's for everyone, but I'm, I'm cool. I'm keen to see where those dudes are pushing that. Size well, it's, it. it's very geographically dependent. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly like, I think in Adelaide, yeah. Well, like yeah, like Whist, um, Whistler, uh, Queenstown is the spot. Like if you're gonna do that type of riding, Queenstown's the spot. Um, mm. Obviously, DHT is never gonna take off in Australia, um, but I think what they're pushing is really cool. Yeah, yeah. Like just do different stuff. That pe- I, I think we can all agree him grinding on his back, hum. I suppose you call it was one of the coolest things I've seen in the last couple of years. It's definitely glad to say. It. Uh, I'll stay out of that one. Um, I'm not not a huge fan of scooter riders. Um, <laughs> no, I am. I think it's cool. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually like 170. Is my number. Yeah, I'm the uh, same. 170 is good. I, I actually, one thing though, like unless it's an XC bike, I've not seen a one or, or Mick, I haven't seen a 175 set of cranks on a, on a trail to enduro bike in, I would say five years. Yeah. Well, the, it's funny because the reason I did it was because I run 175s on my dirt jumper. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just kind of gave it a crack because mm. I was riding my dirt I, jumper a lot. I'm like, huh. I'm all about the testing. Like if you, if you've got it and it like, just test it, like why not? Yeah, I mean, nothing absolutely. against it. But yeah, it's just mm. funny. I've not seen anyone with them. And I remember at SRAM, like we just order less and less and less because there was less demand. Yeah, that's right. It's kind of that old saying, like you can't know you're right if you don't know you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Like hundred percent. Like, yeah, I need to test out the wrong thing. I can't just like take the, someone's word for it because I'm stubborn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I've, 
I've uh, mainly ridden 175s because up until recently, that's all that came on extra large or XL bike. Like, exactly. That's yeah, large that's, bikes. The, that's been the norm. Big bikes, you get 175s. Yeah. You're over six foot. Uh, sorry, you're over 5'11. You get yeah. 175s. Like, that's just been the norm. I don't think that's necessarily right. No. Um, but pedal strikes are less. That's the main thing for me. Yeah. Like the actual balance of your feet and so forth can marginally be changed. Mm. But if you're running clips, you can move your clips differently. Like yeah, you know, there's there's ways to get around it. Um, we're talking about clipping things and stuff. What's uh, why are low BBs good? Are they good? Low center of mass. They're good. <laughs> to it. To a again, yes. a diminishing point, though, right? Like, yeah, yeah, you can dragging. Go yeah, yeah, but there's That's yeah, right. like lower center of mass. Um, you can play with that with suspension. Like we do, we used to do this on the studio all the time. Like slow, slow your rebound all the way down and see how it handles. There's mm -hmm. bad sides to it, but a lot of people are like, oh, I think corners like it's on rails. Like, yeah, can you sit in your bottom bracket? You can wait more. <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> um, and yeah, it is funny because like, and just to jump in there, Lockie. It is funny, hey, because uh, it's always a trade-off. Like, absolutely, you can, say, have more sag in the rear end, which will make your bottom bracket lower, so lower centre of gravity, which means it should turn better. But if you don't account for that in your fork, it'll just be slack, so it won't turn better. It'll just rake out, yeah. Yeah, it'll rake out, exactly. So, yeah, it's it's always a, a trade-off. Yeah. Honestly, BB height is actually a number I have no idea about. It's not, I never, ever look at it. Um, no. And I don't know if that's because it's just kind of in a good place now. But, yeah, like I'm just I don't know. worried about it. I think it, it, it does differ to point between brands. Like I do look at it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's certainly a really important factor. Sure. Um, so yeah, I don't know. And then the other thing of course is like, you've got your BB height compared to how high it is off the ground, mm. but then you've got your BB drop too, which yeah. is the, yeah. the, the distance, like the vertical distance between your axle, like your front and rear axle and, and your bottom bracket. Um, and obviously with say 29 inch wheels, mm. Even if your BB height from the ground is the same, the BB drop will be more because yes. your axle's higher from the ground. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of things that need to be taken into account for sure. Yeah. I think the reason I don't look at BB height is for the most part, I can't change it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you kind of yeah. can here or there with like offset bushings and stuff, but like, it's not like stack or reach that you can chuck a stem on or you can change the travel. Like, I suppose I probably just get used to whatever that is. Mm. Yeah. I think yeah. the BB drop is almost more important than the BB height because it gives you that yeah, that feeling of being in the bike, which I Well, the BB, the BB drop is the BB height. It's just a derivative of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Yeah, with the wheels. That makes sense. Yeah. But I like, like, I really like that. But you can, like, if it's higher, if that BB drop number is lower, then it gives you that more sitting on the bike feel, whereas if it's higher, it's in the bike feel because the bottom bracket's lower, right? Yeah, for sure. And that's why, like, a, a low bottom bracket, and I get where you're going, so why a low bottom bracket feels good, there's two reasons. One is because it's closer to the ground, like you've got a lower centre of gravity Holistically, you got a lower center of gravity. But second of all, that your bottom bracket is sitting, particularly with say with 29 front and rear, your bottom bracket is sitting now marginally, well, a lot lower than your axles. So like you were saying, Darren, one, it's lower overall, but you're sitting in the bike. Um, so yeah, it's kind of two things at play there. For sure. But they definitely corner nicer or stabler is the way i like to de describe it yeah yeah well, I think, I, yeah. yeah i think we i think uh there's obviously a realm in which they need to live i have definitely tested some bikes with a and b that were not low enough <laughs> for sure and then like east ride specialized which nothing yet specialized like they were good but for me a little bit too low 
um, Kiaka, yeah. at, at the time. But um, yeah, no, I've never really thought of that. It makes obviously a bit more info on that one. Yeah, actually, you mentioned it like the specialized was super low. I remember they were so low when they released plus that you had it was advised to get shorter cranks if you wanted to run standard 27.5 mm. because they lowered the bottom bracket so much you'd just be hitting the ground i remember having an enduro 29er i've been a big 29er fan for a long time um and it was sick it's just the bottom bracket was just too low i just couldn't i just could not hit stuff like and i never really had that issue before but um but you know like you have a low bottom bracket and a slack head angle and then like the masses jump on it and it probably feels amazing. And I kind of see why geo has gone that way for a lot of, a lot of brands. Mm. Mm. Exactly. The one thing, the one thing that does kind of, um, and like there are some bikes where say they start out relatively steep where if you did this, it wouldn't be so detrimental, but there are say some bikes that start out quite slack and then people do this to them and they just, it wouldn't work. The one thing that I see quite often, I mentioned it earlier, was it's quite hard to mullet a bike that starts off as the smaller size. So if you want to turn your 27 into a 29, really the only way, well, your 27, 27 into a 27, 29, really the only way to do it is drop your fork by 20 mil. Yeah. There are a lot of people that really don't want to drop their fork by 20 mil. So they just whack a 29 in the front end. And what it does is, is obviously it slacks out the angles, both the seat tube and the head tube, which I personally, I would care more about the seat tube than the head tube. Like the head tube, yeah, you can kind of deal with, it's going to feel slack. Mm. But from a climbing point of view, that thing would just suck. Yeah. But what it does is it lifts your bottom bracket, mm. which I'm really not a fan of. So just to kind of, as again, kind of layman's terms, your bottom bracket sits roughly, roughly, sort of two thirds of the way through your bike. So um, <laughs> your front from the bottom bracket to your front axle is roughly two times longer than your seat stay or your, your chain stay. Sorry. So what that means is if you were to put a 29 front wheel in your 27, it's going to lift your front end by just over 19 mil, which will mean your bottom bracket will raise over 12 mil, which is quite significant. Huge. So if you just chuck a 29 in the front of your 27, 27 and stand back and look at it, it might look a bit, a little bit slack, but the thing you're not going to pick up on until you ride it perhaps is how much you've raised that bottom bracket, which just, mm -hmm. in my opinion, is a big no, no, like the slackness you can kind of get away with the bottom bracket. Like it's going to feel terrible. Yeah. I've never been a fan of mulleting that way. I just don't think it's, no. I don't think it's I, smart. And I think that's always what I've seen. And this isn't to blow smoke up your ass, but like, with WRP, I think that's why that works because you're getting the geometry back to where it is with a mullet specific part. Yeah, for sure. And like, and I'll be straight up with anyone, like anyone that calls me or emails, whatever, is that like a lot of the time there's a better option than buying one of my parts. Like it's kind of that law of dimin diminishing returns type thing. If you're going to have to sacrifice too much to be able to run either my part or a mullet or whatever, mm. you might just be better off on the 29, 29. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know. yeah, I, I, um, 100%, like, yeah. Yeah. Even on, even, even on a, like a monetary standpoint, like if it's going to cost you a thousand bucks to make some custom setup and a new wheel and all this type of stuff, just as a one-off, you could probably spend that thousand bucks in buying a better 29, 29 wheel set. Mm. say like a lighter wheel set that might turn better or whatever i'm just kind of talking shit there but yeah, yeah. no I, I do i i, I agree like i mm. think the thing is trendy i don't think it's a bad trend but i don't think people take into account all the other shit that's going on on pros bikes when they see they've just changed it to a mullet you know what i mean like there's yeah. so much more to that like and even just going mm. down to the way the shock's tuned 
Oh, dude, absolutely. And I, like, I get asked a lot of questions like, oh, why haven't you made a mullet yoke for this bike or that bike or whatever? Yeah. And it kind of comes back to that thing. Like we could, like, don't get me wrong. Like I could do it in a couple of hours on CAD and go get it made. But the point is, even if it's as simple as this bike's leverage curve is just, it's going to be negatively impacted if we were to pull a, put a mallet yoke in it. Like if we were to make a yoke that's like seven mil longer, say reinstate geo, but it's going to negatively impact the suspension kinematics. Yeah. I'm just not going to do it because it's that law of diminishing returns type thing. Like, yeah, it's going to feel sick in the parking lot, but the kinematics are going to be screwed. Mm-hmm. So you might as well just stay on the 2929. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. Like I'm a I'm a huge mullet fan. Like kind of got referred to as the mullet guy at Medina a couple of times, and I do love it. But I'm upfront with people too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like I think when Troy was developing the sender in mullet, when I saw them developing it, like late November 2019, I think they had four chain stays. And parts like just sitting in the back of the van, like it wasn't well, as if they're just throwing a 27 inch wheel in the back. Yeah, and that's the other thing, hey, because and like ideally with the the meta, I would love it if I could shorten up the back end because say with a 27 in there, there's a whole heap of room now, and that's another thing you've got to be mindful of too. Like just say with like making a mullet yoke, whatever, if it's got a really long rear end to begin with, yeah. it might be better off on. A 29. Yeah. Mm. It's going to give you the traction. Like, I'm a 29er fan um, because I'm shit at corners regardless. And the 29er makes me go faster on the other stuff. You know what I mean? Um, I but, think. Yep. Sorry. But no. um, yeah, like 100%. I think people just think if I chuck a mullet on, I can get more Sendy. Which I don't think it's always the case, you know what I mean? Like, especially if you're retrofitting stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the one thing that I will touch on just because, like, I, while we're talking about it, because it's one thing that I think that people don't talk about often is that handling aside whatever, a smaller rear wheel will accelerate and decelerate easier because it's got less mm-hmm. angular momentum. Yeah. So I remember one bloke hit me up and was like, I reckon your I reckon it climb like with your mullet yoke in it's a smaller rear wheel, I reckon it climbs better. Yeah. And I'm like, oh what do you mean? Like over what type of stuff? Like give me a scenario. Because fundamentally, like physically, the 29 will roll better. Or holds um, speed better. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it's, it holds more angular momentum. So yeah. anyway, he was like, oh, you know, there's this, this rocky, janky track, climb track that I ride and yours climbs better over it. I'm like, well, that makes sense because if you're putting in little nippy cranks like, and you need it to accelerate up over a rock or a root or whatever, it will accelerate up faster. So valid point. It probably climbs better. But if you had, say, like just a very long ascent that was just like a footpath, Mm. 29 is going to hold more angular momentum. So just a trade off. But what I was going to say is, yeah, the small wheel doesn't get enough credit for being really good at accelerating fast, changing direction fast. That's why dirt jumpers are so popular. Yeah. And Mm. that's why, like, so many issues have come in with inertia, I feel, with 29ers and braking. And that's why Mm -hmm. it's bigger rotors now, right? Because absolutely, yeah. So much more inertia behind rolling. Uh, oh, um, what's the word I'm looking for when the wheel spins? Um, it's fancy centrifugal force, centrifugal force, you know, what I mean, behind that wheel and that weight and the extra tire weight and all that kind of stuff. Like, 100%. Mm-hmm. Like, that's why brakes are having to change so much. Like, mm-hmm. for that reason. So, no, I, I 100% agree on that front. Yeah. 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 Um, 100%. I actually agree that 27.5 climbs better than 29. On technical stuff because it does accelerate better. Um, controversially, again, but 29, it, it does. I ride both, it doesn't really bother me. Mm. I ride shit on both of them, so it's all good, right? Um, so you're getting fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess the last thing we'll, we'll, we'll touch on with Geo, um, 
I'm kind of surprised Cannondale didn't go down this route. Uh, but what do you guys think of all the new adjustable geo that we're seeing as like a trend now? Like it seems like everyone's got some sort of headset cup or some sort of flip chip. And um, Yeah, um, again, I'm a fan of it. I just, I think some people can get lost in the data. Like there can be too much adjustment where you should just go out and ride. Um, part of me like loves BMX for that reason. Like you just, it's, there's no mind fuckery. You just out there riding. Like, yeah. Um, so I, like I love bike setup. Like this Trinity is fully adjustable. Like, and it will be fully customizable type thing. You can adjust a whole heap of shit. And so I am a big fan of, for having the adjustability. And I think it's important if you are at like the top tier of the sport, say, um, and you need your setup dialed in. But I'm also an advocate for just go out and ride it too. Um, yeah. And I think on the last podcast we talked about, we are talking about suspension or whatever. I think I made reference to a set of uh, boss suspension that I have. It's got like 26 clickers or whatever, high speed, low speed compression and rebound. And the bandwidth is so wide. Whereas like the low end and the high end of that bandwidth, you would just never use. So it's just kind of mm. pointless. Um, so I am going to sound a bit agnostic about it, but I, love the opportunity to be able to adjust your bike. I just think there should be more, uh, I don't even know whether it's educational. I just hope that the end user doesn't get too sucked into just yeah, getting sucked down that rabbit hole because there are already enough people that just spend their whole weekend at Bright just tinkering and not actually riding. So. I, I did the same thing with my nuke proof. Like I had I, I, there's some adjustments I love straight off the bat, like chain stay adjustment, I think is awesome because mm -hmm. you can change kind of how it corners, right? In, in a yep. very simplified form. Um, the reach angle, like the reach adjust thing, I think is also good because everyone changes proportionally, although that is, you know, if you factor both of those in, there's a lot to do. But then when you start to have these like high and low settings, like I had one on the trance and I was like, oh, I've got a setting on there and I was going to actually try and mull it on it. I just never got a chance. But, um, who's putting it in the high setting you know what i mean like well like, yeah and that's like that's something that's really common with um i don't want to sound sort of self-centered here but it's something with the um like the mullet yolks that i make uh make some for specialized and specialized have a flip chip yeah and there are a lot of people that uh depending on shop configuration whatever sometimes people can't run it in the high setting and we designed it specifically around the around the low setting for exactly kind of what you were saying Lockie, like mm. yeah, sort of get it low whatever yeah but uh undoubtedly that setting is superior like on yeah. on most stuff well sorry the point being is the high setting could be good if you're riding around a parking lot but the point being is it's a full enduro bike. Like that bike's almost a downhill bike. When you just, you know, if you want to ride around the parking lot type thing, maybe, yeah, be on another bike. But um, anyway, yeah, we're, we're making like a centralized shock pushing for that bike sort of yeah. was a bit hush hush, but not anymore. But um, just kind of to delete the, well, to get one more setting out of it, but to also kind of delete the, the mind fuckery as well just yeah mm, like I, simple I think in the middle it's good changes that you can change your fit like so right if you want your front end longer you can do a stand we can do a reach adjust i think that's awesome because that tailors mm. the bike to that rider um chain stay i think it's the same thing um progressiveness i think is cool but it's it's a dark realm to go down like that new griff i had was a sick bike because it had all the adjustment but like i spent three days changing everything because i wanted to try it all um because there's like a, a central chip which changes the progression which yep. like, on the coil they were like it just changes the bottom out but it doesn't really just change the bottom out for the for the masses they think it does but it changes the whole way the bike works um that's a hard mm. one you know? so i feel adjustments are good but it's the same with as you said bot stuff if there's suspension with too much adjustments on it like people get lost or cane creek double barrels yeah. like 
I think limit it to stuff that's going to come down to like, if it goes to a bike fit, it's like, they know what the numbers are, right? Like I'm buying this bike. My reach is normally a 455. This is a 450, but I've got a five mil adjustment on the front end thing. I can get that to where, where it is. Mm. That's a beneficial thing. I think when it's stuff that's less tangible to measure, I think it gets hard. And I think if it's a bottom bracket height um, thing, just, just set your bottom bracket height where you want it and they can change the, the rest of the bike around that proportionally. Mm. I think. But, yeah. yeah. And um, just to kind of, because like I've collected a fair bit of data just with what people kind of ride when they're riding my products because I think it would be stupid not to collect that data seeing as though it's so easy to tap into. But um, I probably didn't articulate that very well sort of on my first point. But my point was going to be is what I find funny is bikes that have adjustable geo, whether it's a flip chip or whatever, what you end up finding is it's kind of a bit of that Pareto distribution is that what you end up finding is that the preferred setup is found very quickly and you have 95% of people ride that one setup because there is a reason for it and it's because it's sort of superior. Um, so I am a fan of adjustable geo and at the top end of the, of the sport, I think to get your, your bike fully dialed in, it might be needed. Um, but yeah, on the, on the data that even we've collected with adjustable flip chips and whatever you end up finding that everyone ends up finding the best setup and it always is pretty well the same for that bike. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't think of a Rocky mountain I have worked on where it hasn't just been in the slackest setting. <laughs> like they got nine positions and yeah. everyone uses the same one. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, that's weird. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm keen for chainstay, and that's probably about it. Like the rest of them can go away. <laughs> I wrote a a Da Vinci Troy that had a flip chip in it, and it adjusted the hand gain angle point two of a degree, and raced the BB. I think it was like two mil as well. Like it was nothing. It was pointless. I, I don't even know why they had it. Like your chainstay points are good because chainstay is important. And I think like to go back to the very start of the conversation, but the next important thing is reach. Like in my opinion, like like bottom bracket height's important, but like, yeah, you can be pretty well sort of settled on that. Like you can you can work out kind of what the ideal bottom bracket height is. Um, but, and again, it's a kind of sound self-centered, but that's kind of the thing we're doing with, with Trinity is... Um, we want to get it set up. So, I mean, it's going to have totally adjustable chain stays because they're bolt on chain stays. Um, and then we're going to have custom geo um, for an extra price. Like we'll have three standard sizes or four standard sizes, but then for an extra cost, you can have fully adjustable, well, not fully, you can have a, a preferred reach length. Yeah. Um, and I feel as though, yeah, they're, they're the two big ones if you wanted to talk about sort of custom geo is because that's really what matters. Hey, like you've kind of got four contact points, two of which are human and two of which are the, are the machine. Mm. The two that are human are where your, your feet are and the other two are where your hands are. And that's your reach, like yeah. feet to hand. And then the next one is your wheelbase, like mm. how far in front you, of your feet your front wheel is and how far behind your feet your rear wheel is. Mm. So I think if you can dial in those, uh, yeah, those four contact points, you can pretty well find your perfect setup. That's the next, that's the next step in, I would say for now, downhill bikes. And this is before your bike came out, Nick, but like when the Atherton bikes came out and it was like similar to that bastion design, I was like, this is mm -hmm. the forefront of, mm. of bike fit, and that's where it's going to go. Your yeah, it's totally modular. Yeah, perfectly in that spot. But this is a lot of data that's required with it, and roads done it for years, right? There's so many people on custom bikes. Like I remember measuring Peter Sagan's bike for Ride Mag. I was like, this top tube length is not the same as the C tube length for this size. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> they've been doing this for years, and, and that's where it'll go. It'll go that way in mountain biking, and I think it's awesome if there's an option that's Australian that can do that for people. Like that's rad. Mm -hmm. Um, but that'll be the next big thing is, is that like, I've, I've heard and talked to people about like with Minar's bike, like getting it on like a scale on the front and back wheel and trying to get it at the right gradient of like Fort William to try and get the weight distributed right. 
on the thing, you know, in these ghetto setups to get that weight position. And that's where a lot of these longer chain stays and stuff come from. You know what I mean? So that will happen. And I think that's sick you're doing that, Nick. That's really, Thanks, man. really cool. I dig it. For sure. I think it's cool. Giving it a crack anyway. Shit, yeah. Keep I'm saying it's cool and like give you a free bite. <laughs> Mate, I'm Canada for life now, so <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, I'm on Canyon, so I'm all good. I'm riding my little bike. Uh, we'll move on to the hot or not. And I know that Mick wants this bike so much, but the uh, e electronic DJ bike. What the fuck, man? I don't know where to start, <laughs> other than to say I'm not a, not for it. Why? Like why? Yeah. Why does that exist? I mean, hardtails are so easy to pedal. That's the point. Like. Um, like, well, sorry, I categorise that in hardtails. Like, if it's an e hardtail, that's cool. But an e dirt jumper is yeah. just, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I really don't understand. Like, props to them. Like, I'm not, I'm never going to diss someone for their idea. Nah, I'm dissing them. But, sure. but I don't, I don't understand. It <laughs> like, what, like, yeah. it's, just, it's just some genius was like, I like e bikes and dirt jumps are cool. Let's make this like. <laughs> Like, how many are they going to sell? Like, three. Like, oh, I don't I'm not know. Saying, I think it's stupid. I don't think you want weight in that thing at all. Like, no. And I think, and like, without doing any FEA on the design or anything like this, but heuristical knowledge tells me that they've severely sacrificed some structural integrity on that bike <laughs> to, put a, to put a motor on it, which doesn't sit comfortably with me for a, a dirt jumper. Yeah. Because a dirt I, jumper I, should be strong. Yeah. You shouldn't be sacrificing structural integrity just to fit a motor to it, in my opinion. I think the beautiful thing of dirt jumping is the simplicity of the bike. Exactly. Like I, I have agree. a dirt jumper and I use it twice a year. And when I grab it out, I put some wind in the hoops and off I go. That's yeah. it. I don't need to Look, charge oh, the battery. I don't need to yeah. shift gears. Like yeah. it's good to go. Yeah. So out. So I won't go any go won't go any deeper into that topic. Not. Yeah. Not. <laughs> I agree. Not hot. Yeah, I agree. 100%. Uh, this is one that Lockie wanted to talk about. This is one that I was talking to Mr. Dave Room about yesterday. Uh, compressors for cleaning your bike. Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, and I get, so Rome, Dave's copped a bit of flack and I feel bad for him, but I get it. There's OH and S and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think common sense comes into play with this. If your workplace doesn't let you do it, don't do it. I work at a workshop where I can do whatever I want and I use my compressor to clean stuff all the time. I just don't clean forks. I don't clean bottom brackets. I don't pretty much clean any bearing seal with it. I just clean out mm -hmm. the rag. Um, if like, have you ever like degreased your chain and cleaned it out with an air compressor? It's amazing. And yeah. then you just put chain lip on it and you're good to go. Like, I think it's an efficient tool, um, but just use common sense. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. Don't, um, yeah, I think like we sort of had in that chat locky before here, like if you're not using it to force any dirt into seals or anything like that, uh, the big no, no is spinning up bearings with air. Like if you hold a bearing on your finger and blast and get up to like 10,000 RPM, big no, no. Yeah. But like you were saying, common sense. I think if yeah, you're not doing anything stupid and forcing in any unwanted material to unwanted places, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And, like a little bit like a gurney, don't blast it like yeah. two it's inches away. Same. Like stand back so it's not just fucking blasting it. But other than that, I don't think there's anything too wrong with it. Yeah, and maybe don't spray like excess dot fluid that's on your levers or something. You know what I mean? Like I yeah. get like, yeah, yeah. vaporize like a toxic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I will say I've used it and like it um, to try and wear eye protection at all times. I tend to wear gloves because I have lots of cuts on my hands and blowing air into a cut is lethal for some people. Like, So if you have a hole in your body, don't put compressor air up there. Okay. There are some horror stories out there. But okay. I have read about this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I'm using it for your chain and your cassette to blow out like all the... It is unbelievable. Yeah. It's amazing. It's a game changer. Uh, this is another one for Lockie, which I wanted to 
only because I know he lost power meters and, and having the Tamagotchi on the bars. But um, Yolanda Neff actually raced with no computer or power meter on the, at the Olympics. Yeah. Um, I think that's awesome, dude. And I think road, road cycling, I know this is not the road cycling podcast, but I think I think more people should do without it. I think it's a training tool. Um, I don't think it's something that should limit you in racing. And I think it holds a lot of people back. You know what I mean? Like mm. if you come into that event and you're peaking in your form, you may be able to form, perform better than you have training. So why limit yourself to like, oh, I can only hold this many watts? It just makes the racing robotic, man. And I think mm. your lad is the prime example of that race was not robotic and she flogged everyone. Like, I think it's good. I, 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 I really think that that stuff's a training tool and I personally use it just to measure fatigue um because i just love to go riding and i'll go riding too long and cook myself on the weekend and then be sick all week um but yeah i think it's good i i think take the power meters off take the take the uh weight away and get rid of the tamagotchi which is the best i usually call it a telly but uh the tamagotchi is an awesome awesome way to call your garment I'm gonna, one. yeah i'm going to be real controversial here not to you guys but like perhaps controversial to people that might be listening but i'm kind of i'm against using computers in racing in general. Um, I think it, it takes the purest, like, yeah, it, yeah, it's not pure. It's not really authentic. I mean, I remember running cross country in high school and you weren't allowed to have any pace setters. Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, and, and like the Olympics for the road race, if anyone of this, I need to stop talking about road, but like the, uh, was it the Dutch team? Like absolutely went to shit and it's all because they didn't have race radios. You know what I mean? Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. They rely on this technology. And I think yeah. the beautiful thing in sport is is the um and Dino talks about this a lot, is getting in the zone. And that zone is not a measurable state of performance. You know what I mean? Like that's the story you hear of the overweight mum picking her child up under a car kind of thing. Like mm. that's the moments where people go past their human limitations. And I think having the mm. computer then takes you out of that. Um, yeah well and or on the on the contrary like it could give a maybe yeah an artificial advantage where um it could work the inverse but it's not really in its purest form like yeah. for example i remember when i was a kid i remember we did a race it was in south australia actually at mount gambia like racing bmx and um however it came up but it was like someone was saying like around our sort of our club tent or whatever, imagine if you had like an earpiece in like a radio, how advantageous it would be in BMX if you were coming into a corner and you had like a spotter on the track because everyone's watching, like you can see the whole yeah. lap and you had a spotter that was just saying like cover your inside or yeah. something like that. Whereas conventionally, like you would have no idea if someone was in you inside unless you like looked over or whatever, it would be a huge advantage, but like, I remember the opinion got beat down so quick because it was like, well, that wouldn't be authentic. Like, that wouldn't be yeah. racing. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I kind of tend to agree, like, whether it's a spotter or whether it's a computer where you know you can either back off or go harder or, like, whatever. It just, to me, it's not authentic, but that's just... Yeah, yeah I, I think it's a good thing. Good on your land, your, your land and F, and congratulations on snatching everyone. Winning a goal listening. without a power meter. It was awesome. She's definitely listening to my podcast right now. Uh, fun fact as well, I reckon if you looked, a lot of people popped hard at that race yeah. and were dead afterwards because racing in Tokyo in the summer would suck balls. <laughs> like I have been there when it is like that humidity and that walking around sucks for a majority of Caucasians mm. because we sweat so much more. And it is like it, it takes it out of you. It is so hard. So if you're going off your old numbers, mm -hmm. you're just gonna blow up. Yeah. Like, like Pid, Pidcock did it right. Pidcock made the fucking sweat tent in his house and yeah. made it hot. And and that's happened a lot in road, especially for um world champs in Saudi, I think, a few years ago. Yeah, like, that's right. Yeah. A lot of people who went well, they were like heaters in the bathroom doing four mm -hmm. hours at like 40 degrees. You know what I mean? So, yeah. 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 And I mean, Pitcock also knew that the 
thing in that drop had been removed. So that kind of helped. <laughs> uh, our last one will go with the hot or not thing. And this is because I saw a patent for SRAM. And I know you're probably not going to be able to talk about it. But integrated <laughs> brakes into the bars. So they're basically no cables at all coming out of your bars. That's cool. Yeah, I can't speak for SRAM because I honestly have no idea about any of that stuff. But um, clean cockpit's good, dude. Like road bike looks mm-hmm. sick now without having it. It will take a bit of time to get the head around it in, in mountain bike. Um, how it works through the headset will be a big one, I think, in mountain bike. Like it mm-hmm. can't be the same as road where you've got to cut the cables to serve as a headset because we go through headsets way too much. Um, but I think it's a good thing. I think they'll look more realistic. There'll be less noise. Um, and you can get your number plate looking way better. Yep. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Just don't want to have to work on them ever if they do become a thing, like what yeah. they're planning on becoming. Yeah, I don't know. Like, yeah, yes and no. I feel yeah, the first couple of years will probably be shit, like aero roadies, and then um, it's still be been cool. a couple. <laughs> it's still shit. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't mind aero roadies. Like, I built a Factor One or something. Some I can't remember. It was some crazy bike. It took a little bit longer, but it wasn't mm. in the world. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it, yeah. And and you can charge more money for it from a, from a bike shop standpoint. Like, you make more money from that. So I don't know why it's ever been a bad thing. That's a, this is a random rabbit hole, but bike shops can actually charge more than what is set <laughs> on their freaking service list. So stop complaining yeah. that it's taking longer. Like. Just because a headset change was thirty-five dollars fifteen years ago, it doesn't mean it has to be thirty-five dollars now. Yeah, yeah, it's a crazy concept, but get around it. Uh, all right, listen to questions. This is uh, some good ones. Um, we've talked about Geo this whole time, and someone has asked about Jack Moyer's EWS setup because he runs it such like a conservative way um what are you guys answers or thoughts on why he does that conservative as far as short you mean short and steep i think it's still a 66 degree head angle yeah i i think like it goes back to everything we were saying whereas the if you looked at what the industry is trying to sell you you would think that uh longer and slacker is always better whereas it's not always the case um of what the top guys sort of want to ride. Um, and I think like it's a multi-variable thing for sure. Like I think Jack is one of those riders because he's tall and lanky or whatever. He can put the bike in positions where people just other riders just wouldn't be able to. So having it sort of, yeah, small and agile and whatever. And for the same reason, cause he's kind of tall and lanky. Like I've seen him ride out of things that I don't think uh, normal riders would be able to. So I think he discussed it a little bit on something that I watched recently, whether it was like a collective post or whatever it was. Um, but yeah, he, I think he was saying that the large uh, or the extra large or whatever it was, like the larger size anyway, felt kind of more natural, but with the unknown terrain on EWS course and like tight corners that you don't see coming up and whatever, overall uh, he felt like it would be a better choice. Um so I think that's got a little bit to, to play with it too, just kind of the the ever-changing sort of conditions of EWS courses and kind of the, the unknowns because you don't really get much practice. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I'm sort of stoked to see someone on more of a, if you want to call it conventional setup. I reckon it's cool. And he's slaying it too. I, I think Enduro's found its footing as a sport. Like I think before it was lost – wasn't lost, but it was just like, oh, it's just a little downhill bike. So all the numbers just got pushed over from downhill bikes to that. And and you see even now with travel, like it's not the big travel bikes that some brands are pushing. Um, and, yeah, I think the steeper head tube with a smaller bike is is way better for a, for a racetrack you practice once. Like I'm mm-hmm. not going to say I'm an endurance, but I did that EWS at Derby. Like, and I'd never ridden there before. And, like, you're literally coming into stuff like, is it this corner or is it this corner? Like, mm. where the fuck am I? And you want something smaller to be able to throw around. So I think that's just the way that enduro bikes are going to go. I think they will probably get a little bit steeper for the purest 
uh, enduro tracks that are new. Um, because downhill is such a different kettle of fish. Downhill is the same track for, you know, 12 to 15 runs for a weekend. Enduro is not that. Um, mm. I'm excited to see people going back to their normal size frame bikes. And I'm excited for a slightly steeper head angle because people can be a bit more playful with it and not just planted and plowing stuff. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, again, I'll just sum it up with what I said before, but pro riders place their bike and put their bike where they want it and they can ride their bike and the bike doesn't ride them and they don't just sit on it. So it makes a huge difference if they can do that. I also think like, I'm just going to, I don't want to go down sort of a rabbit hole here, but I'm, I'm also going to sort of just jump in and say, I think it was kind of funny because I think that um, there is a sort of, it's a little bit discontinuous at the moment in the MTB industry compared to what factory guys are running and what the companies are promoting and pushing out. Yeah. Um, trying to remain sort of as third person as I can, it kind of, sometimes it kind of, uh, yeah, it's something about it just doesn't sit well with me. It's like, it would be kind of weird if say like a surfboard manufacturer was selling boards for like high performance boards that were just totally different in shape to what the top surfers would were riding. It was kind of weird. Whereas say people ride, like people go out and buy mouths, but it's obviously different. Like people are like, okay, it's marketed for this. Whereas I think mountain biking at the moment, and I don't know whether I'm right off the mark here, I could be, but I feel as though it's stuck in a bit of a weird place because yeah, what some brands are selling is just not what Mm. good guys are on and i think that yeah i don't know like and again don't want to turn it back into a wrp sort of discussion but sort of with with what i'm trying to do anyway like i'm not trying to fit an agenda or whatever like i just want to kind of listen to what guys want to ride and what they think makes them fast and try to put some maths and physics behind it to back it up and yeah come at it from that angle Mm. 100%. Uh, just because we've been, we haven't mentioned WRP yet. Um, <laughs> this is a good one for you. Uh, <laughs> uh, ben Kilsby. Um, oh, Kilsby, he sent me a package today. I don't know if I've got it here. Uh, anyway, that is, yeah, I know what's in that package and it is sick. Um, <clears throat> and I left it in the car. <laughs> Sorry. Where's my package? What are these packages? Why did I miss out on a package? Because <laughs> uh, it won't work on your brakes. Um, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. No, it will work on his brakes. Killsby's designed uh, like a nipple so it fits any brake. Well, actually, the threads are the same because you can fit SRAM syringes in Shimano quite easily. <laughs> Don't well, yes, do that one unless you know what you're doing. Anymore, so, if you're servicing a Shimano brake, these work amazingly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Don't do that unless you know what you're doing. Because I have seen people blow up ladders. Um, he wanted to know what you thought about the relation between stem length, reach, and fork offset. And that also tied into someone else's question about matching it. How much time have we got? Because I saw, I, if you've, you, you've probably seen me like looking down while I've been talking or whatever, and I've been doing a little sketch kind of on the fly and I'm fully winging it, winging it but I've been doing a little sketch. Here is, here is said sketch. Um, got Bob Ross on the podcast. Yeah, and people are going to say there's no offset in the crown. I know there's no offset in the crown. It's just a winged design to make it look relatively good. Now I'm going to try to draw over this and a little bit like the start of the discussion, I'm probably going to screw it up because I really can't see my own whiteboard, but I'm going to give it a crack. So <laughs> apologies in advance if I fuck this up. I can't see anything and it makes me so sad. There, it's right? actually oh, a really well, good drawing too. I've been fucking around with it while I've been talking and I've been distracting myself. Is that all right, Darren? Yeah. 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 Yep. All right. So one thing that I think a lot of people don't understand or don't maybe don't even know of is the uh, is trail. So 
basically, geez, I'm going to screw this up. All right. If you've got a line that runs parallel straight through your steerer to the ground. So imagine you've got an imaginary line that goes through your steerer. And this is like, not just for bikes. This is just suspension kinematics in general, whether it's trailing arms on cars or buggies or whatever, or moto. So you've got an imaginary line that runs parallel down your steerer. And imagine that keeps going all the way through your front wheel till it hits the ground, right? Now you've got a vertical line, which is your weight force of your axle or from your axle straight to the ground here. Now, this distance, tell me if you can't see this, Darren. No, I can see it, yeah. This distance here is what's called your trail. Now, a lot of the time, people will overlook trail, well, which is a derivative of the offset of your fork. So a lot of people, in my opinion, overlook the offset of their fork. And a lot of bikes like a spec, just with whatever fork comes with it, like 56 mil, whatever, and it'll just kind of be bought without thinking of it much. But the offset of your fork, like how far your axle is out from your steerer line, determines what your trail is. Because if you imagine you've got a really large offset, so now your axle is out here and you draw this dotted line down, is it your trail is actually shorter now? Mm. Yeah. So that's where, just say if you've got a large offset fork, like if you've got like a 56 mil offset fork, say, is that it'll actually feel twitchier than a less offset fork because the trail number is less. Mm. So it's kind of counterintuitive because people, I think a lot of people think that a less offset fork will feel, will feel twitchier where it's not. A less offset, offset fork will feel more stable, mm. but the front wheel will be further from you, like your wheelbase will be shorter. So it's kind of that trade-off, like your wheelbase will be shorter, which might mean less stability, your steering will be more stable. So that's that. Now, the second thing is he asked about your relationship with your stem. Now, I've kind of been thinking about this kind of off and on for the last couple of weeks because I've got a lot of requests, Lockie included, for custom stems that have a reach in the stem that matches the offset. And the more I think about it, the more clout there is to it. And I'll try to explain it graphically with a little bit of maths. Is that just imagine here, say this is whatever it is, like 44 mil offset, which I think is what Lockie has requested. Say you got a 44 mil reach stem, which means that this line, like your effective steerer line that determines your trail, is the line from your, your bar now is exactly parallel with that line mm. all the way to your axle. Now, what that means is, I'm going to rub this out, so I'm going to be a pain in the ass. Um, well, I can't see it. Do it. Hang on a sec. I'll draw it next to it and see if we can... I'll get the face back on so I don't disappear. No, I'm going to rub it out because otherwise it's going to look sketchy. <laughs> perfectionist i like it no i'm a perfectionist you should really? see how many <laughs> you should see how many 3d prints are in this place of parts that i'm like no nah, i'm not machining that looks shit right how am i going to draw this because i'm full winging this um all right shit I'm expecting like full Hambimi spec computer drawings next time. <laughs> like, um, on, I'm going to draw it upright and then I'm going to flip like it. Full Bob Ross, like sitting there with a big painting easel. You know who I followed? I followed a dude the other day and um, he is the guy that did all the original sketches for like all the North American ski resorts and stuff. Which happened, yeah, right. which happened to be the mountain bike trail maps. Yeah. Now, I don't know how it's worked. I haven't really looked into it that deep, but like he's like got the sole contract 
were drawing up all those resorts. And whenever he got I can it, it was see like you. I can see you. Sorry to interrupt, but I'm just very excited. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, I thought that was kind of cool. That's sick. Uh, why mixed drawing? We'll just take away from it quickly. I, I'll just ask Lockie a question. Um, is it damping or dampening? What do you reckon? Uh, it's definitely dampening for sure. Damping? It's definitely dampening on my staunchens. Um, well, if you were to dampen something, it's to moisten it. <laughs> so dampening is wetting something. Damping is controlling a force. There's some specific de definition for it, but um, but you know what? If you went to someone like, unless that like, if you oh, said yeah. to me, I'd take the piss and and correct you, but I would laugh. If you went to someone and they didn't know you're talking about, like that person's just being a dickhead. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, but it's it's uh it's damping. Yeah. All right. Now that I've got right. a point of reference, I think <laughs> I'll be able to make question. I think I'll be able to make good. sense of this. Yeah. So, this is like a bird's eye view of your stem. Right, so imagine you're looking straight down the plane of the steerer. So you're looking at like a 60 degree angle straight down the steerer, right? Yeah. I'm gonna draw this in different colors so you can see. Full Bob Ross spec. Right, orange is your axle. So if your stem, just say your axle offsets 44 mil and your stem is also 44 mil in reach, it means that your your front wheel axle is going to be here. Mm. And it also means your bar, which I'm going to do in a nice purple, your bar is also here, right? Yeah. Now, as you turn, your front axle is going to follow a radius like this. And your bar is also going to follow the radius around, right? Now... If you were to have, here's me a little eraser. I'm going to rub that out. If you were to have your axle here, so you've got the same 44 mil offset, but now you've got a 50 mil stem, your bar is out here. So what it means is when you turn, your axle is following this path here, but your bar is following this path out here, right? And that's characteristic of, of oversteer, yeah? Because your bar is further out effectively on the same plane, like on your steerer plane, as your axle. And that's typically what you get when you have a, when you have a longer stem than what you do axle, mm. you have oversteer. So you've got to turn the bar further than what, like a further distance than what you've got to turn your axle. And that's, the same in motorsport or whatever that's characteristic of oversteer likewise if you have a short stem like a 35 mil stem with a 44 offset back here you've got understeer so you you don't have to turn the bar as much relative to your axle to turn the same distance as the understeer now what it means is as well if you've got a longer stem, obviously you're gonna put more weight over the front. If you've got a shorter stem, it's gonna move your weight back, whatever. Um, this follows on to the next question, which I think you were gonna mention, Darren, that we got from, uh, who was it, about uh, bar roll. Back that all? Yeah. Now this kind of stumped me when, he first mentioned it and then I kind of got thinking and I went and measured all my own bikes and <laughs> coincidentally, and I think there's some clout to this, is yeah. that when I'm going to rub this out again, just say we've got, and again, I'm, I'm winging this, so I could be incorrect with what I'm saying, but I'm willing to put my neck out because I think it's something that hasn't been discussed much. And I, I'm just, I want to have an open dialogue about it. So you've got your stem here, yeah? Let's say you've got 44 mil reach stem and a 44 offset fork. So you've got a totally neutral oversteer, understeer type thing going on. So as your bar moves around, it moves around at the same radius as your axle. 
Now, when I went and measured all my bikes, and I feel as though like I've got a pretty neutral setup as far as bar roll and whatever is concerned. But obviously from the factory, bars have back sweep and all that type of shit. Now, when I measured, because I put a, a tape measure from my grip, like left grip to right grip, right? Mm. My bars, you can kind of forget those lines, but I'll leave them there now, like the radius lines. This is what my bars do. So my bars come out like this. I'm drawing this upside down, so apologies. My bars come out like this. Imagine this is bird's eye view. So I've got my grips out here, right? Coincidentally, and then, but the mass lines up with this is my point. Like there's got to be some clout because the mass lines up. If you, if I drew it like with a tape measure from my right to my left bar grip, it went, oh fuck, I'm going to be off. But it went right above the steerer. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so I'm what so I'm measuring this tonight. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. So this point's meant to go right through the middle there, but you get what I mean. Yeah. And I think there's some clout to this because... It does. I can see it. <laughs> oh, mine. Because I've already explained why I think that the axle offset to reach is important because there is no oversteer or understeer because it's neutral. Now, the oversteer, under, understeer thing can be down to personal preference. Like... If you're in a Formula One car, they have a shitload of oversteer, right? Mm. And depending on what you're doing, whether you're drifting or whatever, and it's the same thing with mountain bikes. Like there are scenarios where people might prefer a bit of oversteer. But I think to understand the maths is kind of important. So if your stem reach is the same as your fork offset, is it's going to be neutral in the way that this, they'll follow the same radius, yeah? And I think to lead that into bar roll is that I think with a matching fork offset to stem reach, you can have a pretty well neutral bar roll for your grips to be in the same line as your steerer. And what that means is when you steer, I'm going to have to like think about this mathematically more, but like I think when you steer, you're going to have basically um how do i articulate this i think you're going to have basically the per perfect amount of uh kind of leverage on your bar mm. in relation to your offset yeah and i think this is like an important discussion to have because i don't know uh, perhaps people have talked about this before but i think there's some clout to this i rest my case that that diagram is awesome, dude. Like, that's perfect. Mm. Yeah. And I well, think thanks, because I winged the shit out of that. <laughs> it does come to preference. Like, that's why I'm ordered a stem for you at my offset. Like, I find the longer stem, I feel it's a little bit, like, I don't know. It can be a little bit slow. And then, like, I've chucked a 35 on or 40. And now it's just too twitchy. I'm just like, this is not right. And then, and then what was in the mm. middle of those is pretty much... The offset, you know what I mean? So, yeah. 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 So, like, again, I haven't really thought about it that much, but I think there's some clout to that. And I think sort of doing some geometric type analysis, yeah, it just kind of points to it. Hmm. But um, I'm interested. I'm interested to hear people's feedback where they think I'm full of shit because I might be. Um, and yeah, what they prefer. And I'd be interested to see what they, like, actually this would be kind of cool. Like just as kind of, like I was saying before about WRP and like getting some data, maybe like people listening to this, like next time you get your bike out, take two seconds, like run a tape measure from right grip to left grip and see if it goes above your steerer and let us know like if it does go above your steerer, cause I'd be intrigued. Mm. I'm gonna do it seriously. Like after this, I'm I'm down. Yeah, <laughs> I'll send you a photo. I'm <laughs> keen. I'm definitely gonna try it, but it all makes sense. Like in my head, that that all just tweaks. Yeah, I, I dig it. Mm. And then there's a there's a second there's a second thing here. Is that um, 
this is something that I'm going to fully win because I don't know. I'm just going off full speculation. But if you were looking at this, like you've got to remember you're looking at this down the plane of the steerer. So you're looking at on like a 60 degree angle to the vertical is that your front wheel contact point is behind your steer. Like it's back here somewhere. Yeah. Cause you're looking down the plane of the steerer. So this is something I want to like, measure now that I think of it is like what your relationship is like because this is what I'm thinking mm. is that when you start to you know when you turn too far to when it feels like it's diving like mm. you know when you try to do like a 90 degree turn back on yourself and the bike gets lean over it feels like it's going to tip yeah is I would think that you're you're turning your bar so your bar say comes down to the point where it's going behind your contact point where your front wheel touches the ground. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So it tucks in. Yeah. And for people that like, I might have lost with the trail thing. The best analogy that I ever heard was the shopping wheel cart, right? Yeah. I'm. I'm yeah. just the same one I've heard. Yeah. It's perfect for trail. Yeah. It is because the shopping wheel cart. I'll draw it like super quick. Now I've got to wrap my own shit out. Super quick. Like that's your shopping wheel cart, yeah? Yeah. So your trail is effectively like, I'm trying to wing this now. But yeah, like as soon as you push the cart, automatically the wheel turns backwards like that. Yeah. Because yeah. like that's, yeah, that's where it connects to the cart like that. Yeah, your trail's reversed. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think it's best summarise your trail. But anyway, that is exactly why you see those big, curvy, long forks on most cruiser bikes. It's they get that massive trail, and it just keeps those bars straight. Mm, yeah, yeah. For getting to the winery. Um. <laughs> so yeah, like I said, I'm an open dialogue with that. Like if people want to challenge it or reckon they've got like better a better analogy or whatever like yeah i'm, I'm stoked to hear it because all for learning me too i'm excited that's an yeah, intriguing I'm keen, thing i'm keen for more and i'm keen for like testing on that like i i would love in an ideal world to see almost stems in some ways being a system of the floor i don't i think they're very i think stems are still from the road world and they're not from the mountain bike world absolutely like i've got my own and i'm not going to disclose it because this has been my idea forever but um yeah i've got my own thinking on that sort of integrated fork to stem thing like because like it's so far behind when you think about it like it's kind of a bit archaic just the way that it all joins together it's uh it's a bit weird yeah like and and even just the 10 mil increment thing for the most part stuff's in 10 mil right except Maybe a 35. Mm. It's like the first thing Darren and I ever talked about. Yeah. And then, but you look at road for like the proteins and like they're on stems mm. and they're on one mil increments, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, I think mountain biking is such a different thing with it. But yeah, I mean, and arguably off the, off the, off the call. Yeah. From you mm. on that. Yeah. Um, cool. That was really good. Uh, that's definitely going to be our best question, I reckon. So I'll get in touch with Killsby on that one. Uh, last question I want to ask. Uh, we'll keep it quick just because it's getting long and I'm hungry. Um, yeah, I'm uh, this is really interesting because I felt the same about this one for Lockie, but um, press fit BBs versus thread in BBs. Press fit gets a bad rap because they tended to creak more. <laughs> I, I just changed your press fit today, out. actually. I'm getting yeah. tools out and I'm, and I'm, and I'm ranting. So Mick, you go first and I can rant after you. Oh, I really had nothing to say other than I changed my press fit today. <laughs> there was no reason to really change it, but I changed from Shimano cranks to SRAM on my road bike. Oh, you're um, a job keeper, eh? You're so good. Hey? You're a job keeper. <laughs> um, you, oh yeah. Yeah. But, um, I personally, 
Look, Lockie's going to be more of an expert than me. Uh, personally, I don't have anything against press fit, bottom brackets. I do understand that from the majority of people that I've spoken to anyway, that they found they creaked more than a threaded. Um, I feel as though that might be down to somewhat the bore installation as well. Um, I will say they've come a long way as well from kind of... Uh, yeah, kind of the technology's come a fair way compared to the original press fit stuff like, uh, and Lockie about to talk more to it, of course, but yeah, I feel as though, like my road bike, for instance, and Lockie might disagree with me here, but for it's a carbon roadie and um, it's got aluminium shells pressed into the bottom bracket that the nylon cup presses into. So you're not pressing a nylon cup into a carbon shell, which yeah. personally, like from bikes aside, like engineering standpoint, I'm just not a fan of pressing stuff into raw carbon, like just really not a fan. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the other thing too is uh, mainly because the carbon layout process, you're not going to get a perfectly round hole. I feel as though that's why it, why it might creak. And then to get a perfectly round hole means machining after the layout process, which means you might as well just put an aluminium shim in there and be done. Yeah, exactly. I think I think your points on the manufacturing are, are perfectly sound. Like that makes sense. That's not my forte, but like, yeah, I think it makes sense. Like I'm not saying that like all bikes should be press fit. I just think they get a bad rap because people do them wrong. <laughs> like, Absolutely. Yeah. So wrong. Like I've seen so many people hitting press fit bottom brackets in and like with any press fit systems, one of the surfaces, which will be the bottom bracket is going to be um, slightly larger than the bottom bracket itself, the shell, and it mm. presses into place, right? So that material is compressing. Um, when you compress it in, you need to use, and I hope people can see this, a bearing press so it presses in flush. If you hit that thing in, it's going bang, 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 and it's compressing either side more than what it's in its tolerance to be compressed. And that's Absolutely. where you see little points where they move, you know what I mean? So, you know, if you're installing a press fit bottom bracket, you do one cup at a time. You don't do two together because if you do two together, it could be on an angle and then go in. Um, so one cup at a time, something flat that's pressing against the frame, in, um, and just use a good quality grease. This is my grease box. I have all my greases so I don't need to get them in tubs out when I build a bike. But in the middle here, there's a clear one. Um, and that's by Morgan Blue. It's called Acroproof Paste. The tub actually says Acroproof Pasta. It's the thickest grease you'll ever find mm -hmm. in your life. And it's like pretty much marine grade. Um, that's been the best thing I've ever found. And that was from Kogel Bottom Rackets. I used to recommend that. Yeah. Um, and that's a really nice grease. It's not a retaining compound that sets and makes getting the bottom bracket out hard. Um, and I honestly, like I've done a lot of press fits and I just don't have issues beyond the bottom brackets, the bearing wearing out in between that. Um, the other problem with press fits is people try and reuse them. And that is a big no, no, especially if they're yeah. an nylon or a plastic cup. For um, sure. When you hit the thing out, even if you've got a nice removal tool, that material is already compressed. So you may regrease it and it's good for a little while, but it's going to come back bad. So I think if people view them as a one use item, it's fine. But if you're trying to reuse something, it's just always going to fuck up. Um, obviously threaded, I think is a easier system um, to reuse, but in terms of the process, they're still the same. You still need a specialty tool um, to install either of them um one's just a press and or one's a a notched tool you know what i mean so yeah. i just think that bad rap i think get the right greases get a bearing press or go to a bike shop and just don't reuse your bottom brackets in numerous times and you're good to go. just add to a point there Lockie. you were saying about uh because i totally agree don't bash in your bearings with a hammer <laughs> <laughs> for one like you said use a rock going instead up. hey use a rock instead way better yeah yeah Organic. that's right <laughs> um for one yeah like you said it can go in on angle yeah secondly and maybe even more importantly say on something like a road bike like carbon road bike the blunt force that you're putting through that frame by yeah. whacking it in is really really not good <laughs> um bikes are not designed to have sideways stress through them. yeah um, i'm sure we've all seen a good photo of like 
tools going through the frame from when they're being hidden to you know what I mean. So yeah, yeah, it's uh, I don't know. I said I think they cop a really bad rap. Um, I've been on a brand that's had press fit for the last five years, and uh, I've never, I've personally never had a creaking problem in those bikes. I did go through my bikes fairly regularly because I changed my bikes a lot. Um, but it's just a new bottom bracket every time. I think it's the key. Um, so people who get frustrated, they just reuse the bottom bracket three, four times and they're shitty because it keeps creaking, but will always creak because you've reused it. Yep. Yeah. That, and I think that's it. Like the nylon is there to be a sacrificial part to conform to the, to conform to how non-eccentric your bottom bracket is. That's a, they're a sacrificial nylon. Yeah. Oh. And it's the same with fork lowers. Like fork lowers work in the same way. Fork lowers are still mm -hmm. a press fit and the sacrificial part is the air assembly. That's what yep. will compress more, especially because it's hollow. Um, it's the same thing. If your air assembly starts to spin and your lowers, replace the air assembly. Um, yep. Yeah. That's my rant. <laughs> That's my TED talk. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, two points I'll add is threading bottom brackets can still creak if you do a shit job at putting them in. It's the same process, right? You still need a good grease and you still need to talk it and you still need to do one at a time. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Also, bottom brackets do not last 10 years uh, and that is not like as if you've done zero Ks on it. And uh, one thing I will say as well, it's not shop's fault because these tools are fucking expensive and they have to be sharpened and the maintenance on them is worse than BBs, mm -hmm. but facing tools mm -hmm. and, and like especially now after the bike boom like bikes got rushed and put together really averagely and the actual bottom bracket itself isn't straight or the facing isn't straight so the bearings sit off kilter so yeah. some mechanics don't know this stuff because they haven't been taught this stuff well going back to Sorry, Lockie, what are you going to say? No, you're good. I was saying, like, I took apart a threaded bike the other day, and the bike will remain nameless, but big brand, nice bike, really nice bike. Um, that had a threaded BB in it, and it had no grease on it. It just had the factory Loctite. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. and I think you're right. Like, I never thought about it, but the bikes probably have been rushed. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. super valid point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I saw the other day, talking about trail, saw the other day and admittedly like it wasn't a high-end bike it was bike from Kmart or whatever and I'm sure you guys have seen this too but forks on backwards <laughs> oh, pink bike Did that. I love that oh yes I know I posted on my page and you know um anyone that's got a business account you can see your own analytics yeah and that's because I got a screenshot and shared it on my story that's yeah. still my most popular story to date yeah, and I, I had like, I screenshot it off yours because Pink Bike had taken it down then. Did they take it down? Yeah, it was just a big no no. I'm like, what? Like, you're the biggest bike like, publication. Yeah. What? Like, what are you doing? That's yeah. no good. No. And like, and go, not to make this go any longer because I know you guys are hungry, but like, there's two slack thing also affects the fork and how that works. But the disc brake being the wrong way just. Crap. Like there was just so much wrong with that. Yeah, I think so we angry. talked about that at the time. Hey, like it yeah. wants to rip the disc brake off. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. With a big rotor too. Like, no, like, no, no, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. So. But forks on backwards, I love it. It's the same. It's up there with people with helmets on backwards. Oh. Well, I had, this is, and more than happy to stick my neck out here, but I had... Uh, I remember this is a couple of years ago now, but I flew back from Europe. I did a downhill race in Europe back to Whistler because I was based in Whistler at the time. And I had a bike shop that I won't name, but I had a bike shop there reassemble my bike because it came out of the, the bike bag, right? And they put, yeah, they, they put the crowns on backwards of the forks. Like, I remember looking down. Why did like, you go to a bike shop to get them to put it back together? Well, so yeah, this no, is the big question here. No, what what had happened was that I had reassembled some of it, and there was still some ready to go. I can't remember what the what the scenario was. I'm gonna put my neck out and say that I reckon it was to go on a date with a girl. I can't remember now, but uh, I didn't end up finishing the bike assembly off. Put yeah. the put the forks back together, like because. So it was kind of 
just going to go down a rabbit hole. But what happened was that the flight back, I got screwed with my baggage because it you could only take 23 kilos, not 32. And because I had a bike bag, like a um, an OGO or whatever I had at the time, that it was over the 23. So like last minute, I had to fully strip my bike down, whatever, and it was in a rush. So I just took the forks off. Yeah. Had crowns, like crowns off. So like forks were crownless in the in another bag, like all that. There was shit everywhere. But um, like honest mistake, like it, it would have been fairly easy to do. But point being is there are some very skilled bike shops on some very high high end bikes that can fuck some things up. Yeah, man. Like yeah, it, it shocked me. It. Like as soon as I got off the stand, I'm like, hang on a sec, something's wrong here. And I couldn't put my finger on it straight away what was wrong mm-hmm. and like look down i was like oh that's on backwards like couldn't believe it yeah you need to find if you're not mechanically minded you need to find a good mechanic and that can take some time once you find them cherish them take mm-hmm. them be, like look after them because they will look after your bike but you yeah you get stuff like that i've seen some very high-end bike shops do some very poor work i've seen some very low end low end bike shops quote unquote do amazing work, you know what I mean? Like it comes out of the person and their attention to detail. Yeah, and I think like on just on that same point, and this is like a Whistler thing, not a it's not a Whistler thing, I, it's it's a bike destination thing, mm. is that I think like, it's gonna be so polarizing, but I, like there are there are there are bike shops in those locations who like they've got wizard mechanics, like yeah. they've got World Cup mechanics there on their off season type thing. Yeah. But there are also people that kind of go there on a working holiday or whatever, and there's yeah. a lot of bike shops in those locate, and they they can't always fill the spots. So there are, like, all I would say is be really careful when you go to some of those biking holiday destinations. That sometimes you're better off just building your bike yourself. Yeah, <laughs> try and find someone who's done some course in something, whether it be a specialized SBCU or a SRAM, you know what I mean? That's usually, I think, a pretty telltale sign, even if the shop's got that on the wall, that the shop mm. cares. Mm. I think that's, you know, anyway. 100%. I agree. I would. Mechanics are still human and make mistakes, though. So. Oh, dude. I, oh, absolutely. I've, I've put so many lowers on the wrong way. Oh, like, yeah. the boxes, yeah. staunchens in the wrong way. Like, I make mistakes daily. I just rectify them generally speaking before the bike goes out you know what i mean <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that's i think that's the difference between like if you're experienced and rushed you'll correct it if you're exper- if you're inexperienced and rushed you don't find the, mm-hmm. the fault you know what i mean 100 mm-hmm. percent. cool anything else you guys want to touch on or oh, all good no i need to pay really, I've, yeah i've drawn enough diagrams today yeah. I think that's been good. Yeah. Sweet. I, I want to fiddle with my bike before I go riding tomorrow. So you want to go run that tape measure from bar to bar. I'm going to do that. And then I need to put my torque cap end caps on and the fork is the rear shocks real rampy. Cause I changed it, but the fork does not do that. I feel the shocks fill the tokens and the fork has none. So I'm going to do that as well. So Sweet. yeah, it should be fun. Rad, I'm going to eat food and go to sleep. Fuck yeah. Awesome. Rad. Well, thanks, sir. Thanks. No, for thank you. Food. It's been good. Um, I pressed record, which is sick. Um, cool. Thanks so much, guys. We'll uh, talk soon. See you guys. Have a good sleep. Cheers. All right. See ya. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thanks again for listening to that podcast. Um, it was epic to sit down with those boys. Uh, we were all tired after a huge day. Um, most of us have 12 or 13 hour days before we even sit down for the podcast. So if you would like to thank them, send them a DM, uh, hit us up, get us some questions, share this podcast around so it gets bigger and makes um, us sounding ridiculously tired and dribbling on more worth it. Um, again, if you've got any questions, send us a DM. Uh, thanks so much to Canyon, um, to Up Bike Co, NS Dynamics, uh, specifically uh, Lead Out Sports for sponsoring this podcast. Um, Fist, Dirt Surfer, and uh, Frank, I think that's everyone. Uh, Bill Kills, Ben Killsby, Bill Killsby, 
that's your new name mate um you are the winner of the prize for this week for your stem related question so i'll send you a dm and you'll get a hundred dollar voucher for that question so don't forget if you ask rad questions you get a hundred dollar voucher for lead out sports and the pedro's tools until next one thanks so much for listening and we'll catch you soon